Good evening, everyone. I am Mayor Jen Wallison, and welcome to the Menlo Park City Council's June 13th regular City Council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating in City Council chambers. For those in virtual attendance, please note that there is a globe icon near the hand feature on your screen. This will allow you to listen to tonight's meeting in Spanish. Our interpreters this evening are Isabel Gonzalez Gutierrez, Alicia Benson, Ricardo Perez Delgado, and Maya Fonseca. Thank you very much for your time and services today, por favor. And can I have one of my interpreters in person translate that for me um, in English or in the English uh, room? If you can turn on the microphone, just so everyone in the room can hear the option of um, interpretation services in person. Buenas tardes. Este, tenemos a dos intérpretes acá atrás, Alicia Benson y Isabel González. Para los que necesitan servicios de interpretación, por favor, pasen acá atrás para coger los aparatos. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Please note that public comment speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers for each item. In accordance with Government Code 54953B2A, when one or more city council members participates remotely, agenda items requiring action will be voted on using roll call. This evening, the roll call vote will take place in alphabetical order based on commonly used first names. I would now like to introduce city council members and staff present. Here with me this evening are Vice Mayor Cecilia Taylor and city council member Betsy Nash. And joining us remotely are city council members, Drew Combs and Maria Dorr, um, and they are participating remotely using the Brown Act. Staff present include city manager, Justin Murphy, assistant city manager, Stephen Stolte, acting city attorney, Mary Wagner, and our city clerk, Judy Heron. City clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the city council and members of the public on how this meeting will proceed? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison, and again, echoing a welcome to our June 13th City Council meeting. For those members of the public who wish to provide comment on an item on tonight's agenda, if you are participating in person, we ask that you complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. For those of you participating virtually, after the mayor calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, we ask that you engage that hand feature that'll be at the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine at that time. That concludes my instructions. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you. We are now moving on to C, agenda review. Agenda review provides advance notice to members of the public and city staff of any modifications to the agenda order and any requests from city council members under city council member report. At this time, does the city council wish to pull or modify any agenda item? City council member door, is there anything on your end? Or city council member Combs? No. Okay, moving on. Um, D is report out from closed session. And for that, I would like to introduce our assistant city attorney, Mary Wagner, for report out from the May 30th closed session. Thank you, Mayor Willison. There are no reportable actions. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. We are now moving on to E, public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it is helpful. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda. 
and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. I will be calling for public comment at the appropriate times for members of the public to address the city council on any item under the following agenda sections, presentations and proclamations, consent calendar, public hearings, regular business and informational items. I will also be calling later on for public comment on the closed session items. So at this time, um, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for general public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So for any member of the public who wishes to provide comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, if you're participating in person, please complete that speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine now. And our first speaker will be Jeffrey Shore, followed by Pam Jones. Good evening, Mayor Wallison and members of council. My name is Jeffrey Shore. I am a Palo Alto resident. Uh, last Thursday, I was surprised to learn that the plan to replace the Pope Chaucer uh, bridge for flood control purposes is at risk. Uh, based on new data from New Year's Eve peak stream flows, the planned downstream improvements are inadequate to contain the increased flows after Pope Chaucer is replaced. The conveyance capacity of the downstream portion is as much as 25% less than what was expected. In other words, contrary to prior representations, some neighborhoods downstream of the new and improved Pope Chaucer Bridge would flood if there were another 1998-like storm. So now what? Well, according to the Creek Authority, assuming the new findings are substantiated on peer review, we have to consider raising the height and the length of downstream top of bank structures. So unfortunately, more cost and more delay. Within 24 hours after this revelation, some of my esteemed neighbors in Palo Alto's Crescent Park neighborhood started rallying support to proceed with the current plan to replace Pope Chaucer. As one of our Crescent Park opinion leaders wrote, quote, it's time to fix the Chaucer Bridge and say tough luck to the property owners who are downstream of the bridge and who might be vulnerable to increased flooding if the bridge is fixed, end quote. I call upon community leaders, public officials, to uphold the Creek Authority's longstanding policy not to transfer flood risk to downstream residents whether they live in Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, or Menlo Park. At the Creek Authority meeting last week, um, uh, Palo Alto's Vice Mayor Stone said the following, quote, at the end of the day, none of us wants to transfer these flood risks anywhere else, especially downstream, but we are far too early to remove any option from consideration, end quote. In my opinion, we should not permit anyone to mistake open-minded consideration of all options for a willingness to increase flood risk downstream. That should be a red line. After all, that is certainly our collective position when it comes to Stanford's Searsville project. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Pam Jones, and this will be the final call for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. Good evening, council members and staff. This is Pam Jones, and I have some inter an interesting um, piece here because it was during the winter and spring of 2013 that the visioning process began for the Bellhaven neighborhood. So here we are finishing up um, the environmental justice and safety elements a bit, about 10 years later. Uh, there's a joint meeting next week in which the council members and the planning commission uh, will be introduced 
to the um, to the documents and the information, and we'll discuss um, the process moving forward. I recognize this is vacation time and that it may be difficult to get a quorum. If there's not a quorum from either one of the city council or the planning commission, my assumption is the meeting would not be held. And that really concerns me. Um, a substantial number of people have spent hours uh, working on uh, collecting the information and developing uh, not just a um, one district, um, a piece of information, but uh, the plan will be something that can be applied citywide. So to have to postpone the meeting, which will postpone everything else that's in the pipeline, is uh, somewhat um, somewhat difficult for residents to understand. It, it almost feels like, um, well, maybe we're not important enough for um, for folks to show up and to be a part of this process. Um, but yes, I know this is this is uh, vacation time. So I urge you to do whatever is necessary to make sure that the meeting moves forward um, next Wednesday on the 20th. And I, I look forward to its presentation and um, and ultimately the comments that are going to come from the city council as well as the planning commission. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you. And thank you to Mr. Shore and Ms. Jones for your public comments this evening. Um, we are now moving on to M closed session public comment. We are offering two opportunities for public comment on the closed session item. The second call for public comment on the closed session item will be before adjourning to closed session later in this evening. So at this time, Ms. Heron, can you please call for public comment for closed session item M1? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item M1, closed session conference with labor negotiators, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. And our first speaker will be Sakni Sai. And Ms. Heron, oh, excuse yes. me, can you please let us know how many public commenters we have? Or at this how many time, we have two. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Council and staff, my name is Sok Nisai, IT Specialist 2. I'm a resident of Stockton, California. I've been with the city for five and a half years now, going on to six in August. And the reason why I'm here is to talk about M1 closed session in regards to labor negotiations. I think it's very important to hear uh, what the employees um, have to say. I think um, too many times, you guys don't get to hear from us or you guys don't get to hear from us directly. Um, we do face many challenges and we do enjoy coming to work regardless. Um, that says a lot about the staff that you have and I have a bunch with me uh, behind. And as you can see, um, there are concerns that we have and that we hope to get addressed uh, during this labor negotiation. We feel that it's very important for us to stand united and share our thoughts because there's an equity crisis. Too many of our colleagues aren't working beside us. The vacancy rate is way too high. I can tell you firsthand that I've had to shoulder some of that responsibility because some of my coworkers weren't sitting next to me or weren't in the same office because they were vacant. We did a study back in November and it shows a disparity with several um, positions, but it doesn't tell the whole story. You know, while some 
positions or close to market rate. There are many of us that are really lacking behind. And as we continue to engage in negotiation, all we're asking for is fair, fairness and equity as comparison to what the market is. We're not asking to be rich, <laughs> trust me. We, we know we're not gonna be rich working for the city, but we know that we enjoy working for the city. We enjoy the positions that we hold, the work that we do day in, day out. And in past negotiations, we weren't well represented because you didn't see coworkers like this come out and speak up and make their voices heard. You know, we had a belief that the process would play itself out and things that, that we would be well represented. And that's just not the case. And this time around, we wanna make sure that we change that, that the, the workers are well represented, that we continue to do the good work, but that we get paid, that we get compensated fairly, that equity is shared amongst us. Just to um, put into context, the vacancy rate for the end of 2023, you know, it's a surplus of more than $4 million. I just wanna ask, where would that equity be channeled to, if not for the workers who continue to make that possible year in, year out? And even with a shortfall for next year, projected shortfall of 0.9 million, a 10% vacancy rate would fill that void and we're at a 20% plus vacancy rate. And studying more and more of the MOU and past MOU, HEPRA has really hurt us. The cost share that we burden has really hurt our families. Even if we get the continuation of the average 3% COLA, 4% COLAs every year for adjustment, that doesn't do any justice because we see a big pinch coming out of us. And that can go towards a long ways. That can help someone who's looking to move closer. That can help someone who has kids to allow them to have a vacation, maybe even put food on the table. As this negotiation process continues, we want you to continue to engage with us you know, we appreciate that you come out to our city events when we have stuff like employee recognition, but how about on a daily basis, once in a while come and see what's going on at the child care center or at the gymnastics center or at city hall where plan permitters are doing business for the city each and every day. We're here for, to fight for equity and engage with gratitude and we believe we can get something done, but we need you to be our partner and to hear us out. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our okay. next speaker will be um, I don't with donated time from Debra Calivio, followed Hi, by CJ Shannon. Uh, good evening, members of City Council. My name is John Seacat, and I'm your plan check engineer here at the city. Uh, I work in the building division. I have worked in corporate America for over a dozen years. I served in the military for over 10, uh, keeping the world a safer place. And now I'm using my talents and my skill set and experiences to answer the call to serve the residents and the council here at Menlo Park. My primary duty here is to 
enforce the California State Building Standards. Uh, we ensure that homes, office buildings, schools, and parks are safe for the occupants. Uh, they're structurally sound and also energy efficient. Uh, among all those things, there are other departments here at the city that have other functions. And to keep the city going, it takes people and money. Uh, we have a talented and dedicated staff, some of which are who are here tonight. Uh, who provide excellent service on a daily basis to the community. Uh, most of the staff here uh, were here before the pandemic. Many persevered through the hazards and uh, hazards of the COVID protocols. And those of us who care about the city, those of us who matter, are still here as we emerge post pandemic. When it comes to money, the last six financial reports from the city show revenues or property taxes have grown steadily. And the city received public funding related to COVID-19 uh, from America Recovery. And another revenue source that is near and dear to my heart uh, comes from the permitting fees where we have uh, a, an upward trend due to the number of, increasing number of permits that we, issue, that we process and issue. Uh, we are definitely a team that is dedicated and put in uh, sweat equity into making new processes work here while maintaining positive customer satisfaction. Uh, that on a daily basis sometimes is challenging. Uh, if I was to uh, have you sit in on some of the phone calls that I have with either residents or contractors, uh, you can watch me dancing on the phone, you can watch me sword fighting, but at the very end, my heart is here serving the city, making sure that we stay uh, in the right and that the residents and contractors follow our rules. The city recognizes that we are understaffed, so much so that from 2017 through 2019, the city financial reports described initiatives aimed at attracting and retaining talent. Yet, we still have some job openings, we still have some job positions that remain unfilled for the past years. Knowing this and working in this environment, it is challenging because there aren't enough hours in a day to do all the work that we would like to do. I came back from being away for vacation and I did have some cover, uh, but I am a my position is just one in the city. And in order to cover for my job duties, we have to bring in outside help. Uh, being gone for an entire week, outside help can only cover a day and a half. And that is typical of the industry that we're in. It's hard finding people who are talented enough to do the job that is required, especially the job here at Menlo Park. And most or all of my colleagues here will attest to the level of service that the residents here require. And if you can't just take somebody from another city, plug them in here and do the same job. And that's, uh, I'm speaking here tonight to give a voice to this predicament. My military experiences taught me that leadership defines the mission. And you've heard that we won't get rich working at the city. Well, it's the same thing in the military. You don't get rich working in the military. You do it because it's a calling. And I treat my job here at the city as a calling. I know I'm not going to make a whole lot of money, but it's knowing that at the end of the day, did I serve the community? Yes. Never has there been a day where I go home and my answer is no. The excellent leadership that I have seen in the past, I know is here. And excellent leadership takes care of the talent that we have here to execute our mission. It also helps maintain the high performance that we have and when needed, boost morale in times that are challenging. And sometimes it is. Uh, thank you very much for listening. We appreciate your time and hope you will consider these points expressed tonight as we continue negotiating our next contract. Thank you for your comment. 
And I would like to turn to City Council Member Doer, who has their hand raised. Thank you, Judy. Um, I would just request that the videographer, could we see who all from the SEIU is, or how many folks are in the audience? And I saw that there were signs, but it was hard to see what they said uh, from Zoom. So could someone, maybe Judy, could you say what those uh, have written on them too? Thank you. Thank you, City Council Member Doer. Uh, so Brian, if you're able to hear us, if you could zoom in onto the audience, just so the audience can see what the in-person city council can see from our SEIU. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker will be CJ Shannon, followed by Adam Patterson. And this will also be the final call for public comment on closed session item M1. CJ, you should be able to unmute your end at this time. Thank you, council members, and good afternoon, uh, members of the public and my fellow members and colleagues. My name is Caitlin Shannon. I am a permit technician for the building department here at the city of Menlo Park. And I wanted to speak today to not only virtually represent um, everything we are going as into items M1, but to highlight uh, transparency that is available for us. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I just wanted to show my support with my union. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Adam Pearson, followed by James Pistorino. Good evening and thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, I was not necessarily planning on speaking, so I apologize. I have it written on my phone and it's a very small font. Uh, my name is Adam Patterson and I'm a management analyst too in the community development department. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone, council, staff and union representatives for all of their ongoing work on the labor negotiations. Um, I helped staff a housing resource fair this weekend at the Bellhaven Library. Uh, and I was happy to see Mayor Wallison and Vice Mayor Taylor there. I mention this because it's an example of how dedicated we all are to the city, working nights and weekends to make it a better place, and in this case, working on an issue that was identified as the city council's top priority, housing. I love having the opportunity to be part of events like this, and we will need more of them if we want to achieve the housing goals we've set forth for the next eight years. I think we all desire to do our jobs effectively and enthusiastically, even on weekends. A large part of doing so is to be able to, without worry of whether we're being compensated fairly. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be James Pistorino. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? James, you should be able to engage your microphone at this time. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So calling forward. James Pistorino. I, I hear him, Judy. He's saying, can you hear me? But he is talking. Um, it, it's a very, very low volume. OK, we're not able to hear James in the chambers. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Mr. P Pistorino, uh, it, it looks as though in chambers they're not hearing you. Um, no. But I can hear you, <laughs> um, so I don't. I don't know how that gets resolved. Uh, Council Member Combs, are you able to uh, hear the speaker clearly? Uh, no, I can barely hear him, but, okay. but but I can't hear him. Okay. I'll try that. Me... I will try zooming back in again. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, Mayor Willison, at this time, uh, James was our final caller or our final hand raised in card. We can continue to our proclamations until James rejoins and may have the ability to engage the microphone and take comment on M1 for James Pistorino at that time. Um, I see he's raising his hand again. If oh, okay, okay. great. So James, you want to try unmuting now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, we're still unable to hear you. I'm curious if could we relay the message if we can hear James or is city attorney for that? Unfortunately, I'm seeing an, a, a shake of the head. Okay. Thank you. Uh, James, if you'd like, you can also email the city council at city.council at memopark.gov. I'll come to the council chambers. If you'd like to email your comment there, I can ensure that the city council will receive it. He, Judy, he has said he, he will come to the council chambers. I'm not sure if that's for this meeting or for a future meeting, but um, I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. council member comes now. We can't hear you. You can't hear me either. Please speak up. I said, Mr. Pistorino said that he would come to the council chambers, um, but, but it was is not clear to me whether he is going to come for this meeting or a future meeting. But but that that was his his response uh, to his the inability for you all and the chambers to hear him. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Um, and I believe there's a phone number too that can be used on Zoom. So that might be an avenue to pursue. And Mr. Pistorina, if you can hear me, if you do end up being able to connect with us later and perhaps City Clerk Karen can um, sync up with you, we can um, hear your comment at that time. Um, so I do wanna thank all of our public speakers um, who many, have, thank you, Mr. Sai, and thank you um, to all the employees who spoke. And um, we appreciate hearing your comments. And we will have another opportunity for comment on the closed session item prior to adjourning to closed session this evening. So at this time, we are going to move to F, which is our presentations and proclamations. We have two proclamations this evening. F1 is a proclamation recognizing Juneteenth Day, and F2 is a proclamation proclamation recognizing June 2023 as Pride Month. City Clerk Heron, do we have any public comments on our proclamations F1 and F2? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public would wish to provide comment on item F1, a proclamation recognizing Juneteenth Day, or F2, a proclamation recognizing June 2023 as Pride Month, Participating virtually, please engage that hand feature at the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at the back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on our proclamations items F1 and F2. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you. So we will begin with F1, which is a proclamation recognizing Juneteenth Day. Juneteenth is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. From its Galveston, Texas origin in 1865, the observance of June 19th as the African American Emancipation Day has spread across the United States and beyond. Today, Juneteenth commemorates African-American freedom and emphasizes education and achievement. It is a time for assessment, self-improvement, and for planning for the future. Its growing popularity signifies a level of maturity and dignity in America that is long overdue. In cities across the country, people of all races, nationalities, and religions are joining hands to truthfully acknowledge a period in our in our history that shaped and continues to influence our society today. Sensitized to the conditions and experiences of others, only then can we make significant and lasting improvements in our society. And we do want to invite all members of the public to the Menlo Park Juneteenth celebration, which will be taking place this Saturday, June 17th at the Carl E. Clark Park at 10 a.m., is that right? 
um, at 10 a.m. I believe the information is on our website and perhaps city manager Murphy will be making an announcement about that in his reports later this evening as well. Um, and with that, we are gonna move on to item F2, um, which is a proclamation recognizing 2023 as June, 2023 as Pride Month. Whereas the city council of Menlo Park recognizes and proclaims the month of June, 2023 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ plus Pride Month throughout the city of Menlo Park. And whereas Menlo Park joins the County of San Mateo to observe Pride Month, honor the history of LGBTQ plus liberation movement, and to support the rights of all residents to experience equality and freedom from discrimination. And Whereas the rainbow flag is widely recognized as a symbol of pride, inclusion, and support for social movements that advocate for LGBTQ people in our society. And whereas all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, LGBTQ plus individuals had immeasurable impact to the cultural, civic, and economic successes of our country. And whereas the city of Menlo Park is committed to supporting visibility, dignity, and equality for LGBTQ plus people in our diverse community. And whereas, while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQ plus equality, it is essential to acknowledge that the need for education and awareness remains vital to end discrimination, prejudice, and violence against the LGBTQ plus community. And whereas, Celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for San Mateo County's LGBTQ plus community and is an opportunity to take action and engage in dialogue to strengthen alliances, build acceptance, and advance equal rights. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the rainbow flag raised on June 1st recognizes and celebrates all LGBTQ plus residents whose influential and lasting contributions to our neighborhoods make Menlo Park a vibrant community in which to live, work, and visit. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Jen Wallison, Mayor of the City of Menlo Park, on behalf of the City Council and City, hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as Pride Month in support of the LGBTQ plus community and call upon members of the Menlo Park community to strive to eliminate prejudice and to embrace the beautiful rainbow of human experience that encompasses all people everywhere. And I would now like to introduce the director of the County of San Mateo's LGBTQ Commission on the Status of Women, Ms. Tanya Beat. Welcome, Ms. Beat. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank okay. you. <laughs> I didn't mean to sound humorous about that, but you never know. Um, my name is Tanya B. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm actually also the director of the LGBTQ Commission, um, and that's why I'm here uh, today in that role and capacity. Thank you, Mayor Wilson, and thank you, City Council members and city staff. Yay, staff. Um, I just want to thank you for the proclamation um, for Pride, which seems sort of like, oh, yeah, Let's just do it again this year, right? I mean, I mean, I do this a lot with different cities and with the county, but I really just want to point out how important it is and how important it is for our civic leaders to be taking the stance. You should be very proud of yourselves because our youth need to see leaders be able to tell them that who they are and the visibility of who they are is important. This last weekend, we celebrated the county's pride. And I was in a session that I was facilitating with our elder LGBTQ members doing storytelling. One of them was relaying a story about how in the early 70s, they were at a, a pride parade. And then they were like, yeah, it was for LGBT. No, wait, it was only LGB. No, wait, it was just, it was just gay. No. It wasn't even just that. It was called the Freedom March because in the early 70s, they didn't have language to express who we were and who they were. So they called it the Freedom March. Now, over 50 years, we have language. And yes, acronyms can be a pain, I know, but they mean so much. 
And because of that language, because of that visibility, because of that inclusion, we are now seeing a huge backlash. The ACLU reports 491 anti-LGBTQ bills being passed across the United States. It's unbelievable. That's more than twice that were passed last year, and I can't even believe that we're dealing with this today. So your visibility makes a huge difference. It makes a difference to me. I don't live in Menlo Park, but I go through it quite often. And it makes a huge difference to our elders as well as our young people who wonder, do I belong here? And when they can go around and see the pride flag up, it's important. And I really beg the city council to consider doing visibility year round, whether that's continuing keeping the flag raised at some point or at some location year round. I think that kind of visibility can do wonders for the community. And on that note, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate that. And one last thing, Menlo Park Library, one of my favorite libraries is running a screening of a documentary called Coming Out 50 Years Later. Oh, I'm sorry, A 50-Year History. It's going to be taking place next Tuesday, June 20th from 6 to 7.30 at the library. Um, and one of the Pride Center staff is going to be there to hold the discussion after the documentary is shown. So thank you, Menlo, Menlo Park. You are doing such great things and please let the commission know whenever you need our support for anything. Thank you so much, Ms. Beat, for being here tonight and speaking about the importance of this recognition. Um, and I think we stand with um, all members of the community that are feeling um, living under fear right now and um, that we wanna be a place where people, people can feel comfortable and welcomed. Um, so thank you for your words. Um, I want to turn over to my colleagues to see if they want to say anything on either of the proclamations. I see Vice Mayor Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And, and thank you, um, Ms. Beats, for receiving the proclamation um, this evening. And I wanted to make a comment on the on Juneteenth proclamation. Um, I have a request um, from council, um, and I've already spoken with the city manager about this, and that is to fly the Emancipation Proclamation, the Juneteenth flag year round, um, considering that this has been a part of American history since 1865, actually 1862. Um, I think it's long overdue. Um, the second is um, when I think about resilience and the words in the proclamation, um, recognizing the power and resilience of black communities specifically here in Menlo Park. And the fact is we are still looking um, standing up for, speaking up for um, the continued journey of dealing with unequal justice, unequal rights, unequal opportunity, um, and sadly, oppression. And I bring this up because it is still a factor, and I know some folks um, are not aware of it or don't understand it, but it does still exist, which is why I believe the flag needs to fly indefinitely. The second is I, I will make my request during the budget because I believe if you truly want to invest in something, um, it's a reflection in where you put your resources. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Would anyone else like to comment on either of the proclamations? Okay, well, thank you again, Ms. Beat, for being here. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor, for your words. And with that, we are going to be moving on with our agenda. So we are now moving on to G, which is our consent calendar. Under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion, unless a city council member, city staff member, or a member of the public requests that an item be discussed or continued to a later date. City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment on the consent calendar? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So if anyone would like to provide comment on our consent calendar items, G1, city council meeting minutes, G2, an agreement for investment advisory services, G3, a resolution approving a list of eligible projects for SB1, or G4, an agreement 
uh, for the Haven Avenue Streetscape project. Participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. All right, so thank you, James Pistorino, for coming in. <laughs> you can come right on up with a comment on item G2. Come down here today. Unfortunately, I live so close that I could be here in just a few minutes. I just wanted to comment very briefly on G2 um, because I think it's a topic that comes up across multiple um, issues before the council tonight, including the closed item agenda that I came to speak earlier. Um, in particular, with regard to G2 and the um, investment philosophy or policy of the city, um, I wanted to just make this one point. Um, I understand that it's based on environmental and social factors as opposed to maximizing the returns. So I believe the city has something like a $38 million investment. So rather than investing uh, that money to maximize the returns and thereby reduce the burden on the taxpayers. Apparently the city has so much money, so flush with cash that environmental and social factors are more important. Those factors outweigh the burden on the taxpayers. So just wanted to put that out there. Maybe the city should, especially in light of some of the other items on the agenda for the city, maybe the city should rethink that idea. Maybe maximizing return for uh, on the investment and minimizing the burden on the taxpayers, something the city should consider. That's it, thank you. Thank you for your comment. This will be the final call for public comment on our consent calendar items G1 through G4. Seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you, Mr. Pistrino, for um, your comment and for coming down to City Hall. It is nice to live in a community that's small enough that you can be uh, Zooming in one moment and then live in Council Chambers in the next. Um, so at this point, we will bring the consent calendar up to the dais. Um, are there any comments, questions, um, things to say about the consent calendar, or does somebody want to make a motion? Uh, City Council Member Nash. I would be happy to make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Is there a second? Council Member Dorr. A second. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash, a second by City Council Member Doerr to approve the consent calendar. Any further City Council questions or discussions? Seeing none, by roll call vote. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We are now moving on to our public hearing. Item H, public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all interested parties on a proposed action or item. The first public hearing, and I believe our only public hearing tonight, is H1, public hearing on proposed fiscal year 23-24 budget and capital improvement plan. And to introduce this item is our administrative services director, Ms. Brittany Mello, please. Good evening, City Council. We are pleased to be presenting you with the proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 budget for your consideration this evening. Next slide. So tonight we'll be, we will be focusing on the general fund, which is the city's largest operating fund, as we review the proposed fiscal year budget and capital improvement program, along with the five-year general fund forecast. We will also be highlighting the City Council's priorities that went into the budget development process, 
and some key budget strategies for the council's consideration. Next slide. So we wanted to take a moment to highlight the core budget team that helped prepare the citywide budget. In particular, I'd like to highlight Marvin Davis, who is joining us via Zoom, and Ronnie Singh and Adrian Patino, who are here in council chambers with us. Um, they all helped prepare the budget and the city's open gov transparency portal. So we thank them for their efforts. And on the next slide, we have the budget contributors from the various departments with whom each can, uh, we wouldn't have been able to put this budget. So thank you. Okay. So on the next slide, we wanted to spend a few minutes to highlight how the city has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic over the past few years and is still feeling these impacts. So these estimated total revenue losses use the fiscal year 2018-2019 as the baseline year prior to when the pandemic began impacting the budget in the last quarter of fiscal year 2019-2020. We estimate a total revenue loss of 34.8 million across these three major revenue sources over this five-year period, which includes the upcoming fiscal year 23-24, as we are not yet fully back to pre-pandemic levels. These numbers include both the actual revenue losses as well as the estimated losses based on how these revenue sources would normally be expected to grow year over year. Additionally, our expenses continue to rise year over year as we have slowly restored personnel following the COVID-19 staffing reductions and added FTEs to meet growing service demands. So sorry, I'm gonna have to... Pull up one other item. The printer didn't like me today. <laughs> and so on slide six. So this slide helps visualize the pandemic's impact on the general fund over time and indicates a breakdown by revenue source. So when the city experienced approximately 34.8 million in revenue losses, the city did receive a total of 8.3 million in American Rescue Plan Act dollars and our revenues have slowly rebounded. Next slide. So similarly, this slide shows the trend of general fund expenses throughout the pandemic with a sharp dip in fiscal year 2020-21. As council can see, the proposed fiscal year 23-24 expenses are nearly flat with the current fiscal year. This slide focuses on how the city's staffing levels were impacted by the pandemic. In 2019-2020, we had a total of 286.75 FTEs or full-time equivalents, which fell to 242.75 the following year due to COVID-19 related budget shortfalls. We have a total of 290.5 FTEs in the current fiscal year with six additional FTEs proposed in fiscal year 23-24. Of note, approximately 240 of these FTEs are funded through the general fund, while the remaining FTEs are funded through restricted funds like water, childcare, and transportation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Assistant City Manager Stephen Stolte. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so the city council held its annual priority and goal setting workshop <clears throat> in March, and it was very helpful because it provides direction to the city manager and staff on aligning resources around the top five city council goals, which are housing, emergency preparedness, the climate action plan, activating downtown and safe streets. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We presented this information at the public budget workshop on June 1st, so I will move a little quickly through these updates, but there's so much good work going on across all of our city departments um, <clears throat> in relation to the city council priorities. And the first is housing. So we will continue to initiate housing element programs, continue the good work on the safety element and environmental justice element. There are multiple housing projects in the works, including both market rate and below market rate units and streamlined online um, permitting. Next slide, please. 
With emergency preparedness, we have an exciting goal to hire, hire an emergency preparedness coordinator this fiscal year. Um, we are excited to coordinate with the Menlo Park Fire Protection District and partner with community organizations on resilience at the neighborhood level. Regarding the Climate Action Plan, I would refer council and the public to our recent update on Climate Action Plan uh, progress. There is a lot going on in this space. One exciting thing I would highlight is an upcoming consideration by the City Council of $4.5 million in state funding for community-wide electrification. Um, but staff are hard at work with electrifying city operations <clears throat> and per pursuing uh, sea level rise work, supporting the Environmental Quality Commission and more. Regarding activating downtown, um, our interim economic development manager will be starting next week. We're very excited to welcome her and we will be planning to fill the position on a permanent basis as well. More to come this summer on the Streeteries Outdoor Dining Program and enhanced public outreach, especially in the downtown area. Regarding safe streets, <clears throat> there's a lot on this slide. There's so much going on. Um, I, I won't dig too deep into here, but um, there's a really big focus on safety and supporting the Complete Streets Commission efforts. Thank you, Stephen. And so now we will be reviewing the proposed budget at a high level. Staff did include several attachments to the staff report that provide a detailed analysis for council's review and consideration. And additional details were provided at the June 1st budget workshop, a video of which and the PowerPoint slides are available on the city's website. So next slide. So starting with the proposed fiscal year 23-24 revenues, we wanted to call out a couple of key assumptions on this slide as we will, we will be reviewing these assumptions in greater detail during the five-year forecast. So um, one thing to note that since our budget workshop, we have updated our vehicle license fee projections with the latest information from our consultant, HDL. And additionally, the proposed budget excludes 1.6 million in revenues um, from the utility users tax. Next slide. For the proposed budget's expenses, really as a service organization, our personnel costs do represent the largest expense category for the city. Our terrific and dedicated staff enable the city to provide a wide array of services to support our residents, businesses, and visitors. In the proposed budget, there are 296.5 FTEs, which includes six FTEs to support the Menlo Park Community Campus operations. The proposed budget includes a vacancy rate of 10%, which is based on an, anal an analysis for the city's existing vacancies and when those positions are likely to be filled. It also includes a $3 million transfer for the capital improvement program and 3.7 million in um, American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA funds. Next slide. So, so taken all together, the proposed revenues and expenses result in a deficit of $0.96 million. Note that these numbers have been revised since the budget workshop due to the latest vehicle license fee or VLF revenues. Of note, we are meeting our policy minimums for the emergency contingency and economic stabilization reserves, and a more detailed fund balance breakdown is, has been provided in attachment F. Next slide. So while departments largely strove to keep their expenses flat, the proposed budget does contemplate a few key service level enhancements. The Menlo Park Community Campus is anticipated to open in early 2024, Annual operating expenses, along with the proposed staffing level restorations and enhancements, are estimated at 1.2 million annually. Note that only half a year of operating expenses have been included in the proposed budget. There are a few proposed technology enhancements for the police department, including flock cameras, in-car cameras, and voice logging equipment, totaling 1.04 million, which represents a multi-year investment for ongoing programs. Additionally, there is a proposed partnership with San Mateo County to fund a mental health clinician as part of the Community Wellness and Crisis Response Team. There are two climate action related service level enhancements, including expenses to purchase equipment for public works staff to transition the city's landscaping equipment to electric and to support a rebate program for gardeners, landscapers and residents to do the same. 
And last but certainly not least, there are funds for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging initiatives that will be led by the city manager's office. So next we'll be diving in a little bit more to the department budgets. Note that during the budget workshop, each department head had a chance to present additional information about what they were able to accomplish with their teams over the past fiscal year and highlighted some of the exciting initiatives that are proposed for the upcoming fiscal year. So we encourage you all to review that and we're, we'll be focusing on really a high level overview this evening. So this slide provides a quick snapshot of general fund revenues and expenses by department. In preparing their budgets, departments did work to maintain expenses at prior year levels where possible, given the current financial forecast, which we will be diving into the next section of our presentation. Additionally, this slide shows the number of full-time equivalent personnel funded out of the general fund for each department. Some departments have additional staff funded out of other allowable funds. And note that the FTEs um, included do include the six um, SLEs, for the Menlo Park Community Campus. Next slide. So moving on to our five-year general fund forecast, we wanted to take a moment to highlight the importance of not just looking at a single year's budget, but also looking at what is on the horizon for the city over the next five years to assist the city council with their long range planning efforts. This forecast is a tool that helps develop a shared understanding of known budget pressures that the city is facing over the next few years as well as help the city council as they develop a strategic approach to addressing these items. Next slide. So staff has prepared the general fund five-year forecast based on known revenue and expense assumptions. Many of these variables are subject to change over time as economic conditions evolve and other unforeseen variables are factored in. So this can be thought of as a living document. Staff has been provided some key revenue growth assumptions based on current financial projections and input from the executive team and expert consultants, including HDL, Muni Services, and San Mateo County. One thing to note is that the vehicle license fees have been updated by 1.5 million since the budget workshop. This forecast does include a total loss of 8 million over the five-year period due to the exclusion of utility users tax revenues. Additionally, the five-year forecast includes an annual $1 million use of the California Employers Retiree Benefit Trust that can only be used on retiree health premiums, as well as the use of ARPA funds, which will be discussed further in the budget strategies section. Next slide. So the general fund five-year forecast includes 239.97 full-time equivalents funded out of the general fund and which includes normal placeholder wage, wage increases per year and standard CPI increases for benefits and other operating expenses. The remaining items related to the city's CalPERS unfunded accrued liability and the annual CIP transfer will be discussed during the budget strategies portion of tonight's presentation. Note that fiscal year 2024-25 includes an estimated $4.5 million refund related to the utility users tax. Next slide. So looking at the overall results of the five-year forecast, the city's total reserve balances trend downward from 36.4 million to 25.1 million. As the council is aware, there is considerable uncertainty related to vehicle license fees with ongoing advocacy efforts from local government agencies. While the emergency contingency reserve is able to be maintained over the five-year period, the economic stabilization reserve is depleted down to 12%, falling below minimum policy levels. Additionally, the unassigned fund balance decreases to 250,000, which is the minimum necessary to maintain cash flow. Next slide. So the emergency contingency reserve was established in 2011 to be used for declared emergencies only. This graph helps show that the city is able to meet the minimum 15% policy levels for this reserve over the five-year forecast. Next slide. The economic stabilization reserve was also established in 2011 to be used for severe operational budget deficits or to mitigate the effects from unforeseen changes in revenues or expenses. 
This graph shows that the city is unable to meet the minimum 20% policy levels for this reserve over the five-year forecast, starting in fiscal year 24-25, dipping down to a low of 12% in fiscal year 27-28. This really helps illustrate the structural imbalance between our revenues and expenses over the coming years. Moving on to our capital improvement program. Next slide. So the overall capital improvement program has 81 funded and carryover projects with eight new projects. There are 27 ongoing and new projects that are receiving funding in the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 budget. And note that when we say funded, it's really referring to first year funding only. Carryover projects may have additional funding through grants, donations, restricted funding sources, et cetera. Next slide. And so here is a list of the major completed projects from the capital improvement program over the past fiscal year. A couple that we wanted to highlight are the Bayfront Canal and Atherton Channel flood protection and habitat restoration project which ties to the city council priorities of both emergency preparedness and climate action, and the Chilco streetscape and sidewalk, sidewalk installation, which ties back to the council priority of safe streets. On the next slide, we have the list of eight new projects added to the capital improvement program. This list was updated based on the May 9th city council study session feedback, particularly the Bellhaven Park improvements, was added using the Community Amenities Fund. And next, I'll hand it over to Stephen. <clears throat> Thank you. So given the trend in our five-year forecast, we talked about a structural um, imbalance. The City Council may consider a variety of budget strategies. The general fund is facing strain, largely due to the loss of our utility users tax, um, the repayment of that tax, growing demand for services, and then of course, rising costs. So next I will walk through the details of different budget strategies um, to help facilitate a council discussion. Next slide, please. <clears throat> First is the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, as we stated before, $3.7 million is being recorded as revenue in the proposed budget. Um, staff also went back and looked at ARPA eligible expenses since 2020. And these are things like um, support for struggling restaurants through the outdoor dining program, um, purchase of COVID-19 testing or P uh, supplies or PPE, um, HVAC work, stormwater projects. There's a lot of eligible expenses and they total about $880,000 just to give you some context. So we will revisit this in a discussion. Um, the second is the general fund's annual contribution to the capital improvement plan. You heard that in the proposed budget, we are maintaining the $3 million um, contribution, but in outer years in the five-year forecast, um, that the assumption is that that contribution is reduced to $1 million each year. In that case, the city would need to rely more on restricted funding sources and grants. So there is a potential implication there with long-term uh, deferred maintenance costs rising. Um, but there are savings, particularly in the short term, as a strategy of $2 million annually. Next is the additional unfunded accrued liability payment. So in 2014, the City Council created the Strategic Pension Funding Reserve, and that reserve has been used to pay approximately $1 million per year against the UAL. Um, the council may consider, <coughs> excuse me, revising its adopted budget strategy <coughs> to implement these annual payments to achieve amortization of the CalPERS net pension liability in accordance with a 15 year schedule. Um, what is currently in the proposed budget and five year forecast is a suspension of these payments for two years and then a uh, $500,000 payment in the last three years in an effort to save reserves in the short term. The pot potential impact is $3.5 million savings over the five-year forecast. However, that does increase the amortization schedule. Next, um, under city council direction, staff segregated a variety of funds from the general fund, like the one-time developer payment fund, Bayfront mitigation, and two amenities funds. 
These funds may be considered by the city council to maintain general fund expenditures and certain capital projects. One example is use of the one-time developer payments fund to maintain service levels and staffing at MPCC. The potential impact varies because those fundings have different uh, spending restrictions and goals. <clears throat> Next is adjusting our master fee schedule. This is already planned by staff as uh, for council consideration in August of this year. And just to, um, just to let you know, the, the current fee schedule is based on a previous study that took over a year to complete and it was last updated in 2015. So the potential impact of, for example, a 3% CPI increase to our master fee schedule would result in $180,000 in extra revenue annually. Next are potential service level reductions. There are some examples on the screen. Uh, two items that could be considered are um, median landscaping and then weeding and park maintenance. For These are examples, a 20% contract service reduction in each of those categories would result in $115,000 and $90,000 annual savings respectively. Staff also included transportation on-call support contract reduction in the proposed budget for uh, $34,000 savings. Next slide, please. Next is um, reserve policies. So there is a city council procedure that provides a fund balance policy. And you can see the policy ranges for two of our reserves on the slide. Our reserves are a component in maintaining our uh, AAA bond rating. That's the highest available credit rating. It, it enables us better access to interest rates and financing options for capital projects and more. The city council previously directed staff to look into reserve policies and especially in comparison to neighboring cities and very initial research um, into just the 20 cities in San Mateo County alone shows that Menlo Park is pretty much in the mid range um, and similar to about half of, the, half of the 20 cities. Three cities have higher minimum levels and we are most similar to uh, five. So the five that we're most similar to were right around uh, 35, 30, or 33%. Um, there's four cities that have minimum levels of 25%. The, the highest are actually 50, 60, and 100%. Um, and what's interesting, and this is just initial analysis, the largest cities in San Mateo County, perhaps because of their most more diverse revenue sources, they tend to have smaller reserves. Um, smaller cities tend to have higher reserve policy levels, and it might be because of more financial vulnerability um, in downturns. The five largest cities are all around 25% or less. So the city uh, council could direct staff to research this further, include additional cities, perhaps in the South Bay and return for, with more information. And on the next slide, um, and finally, uh, the, the council may evaluate placing a revenue generating measure on the November 2024 ballot for voter consideration. Staff has pre prepared initial estimates of revenue. So for our transient occupancy tax, an increase between one and 3.5% could generate 870,000 to $3 million annually. To compare us to other cities, um, this is initial research just based on San Mateo County again. Uh, seven cities, including Menlo Park, are at 12% currently for TOT. Uh, nine cities are above, and the bulk of those cities are at 14%. Uh, one city is at 15 and one city is at 13. There's only one city below us. So additional research would be conducted on neighboring cities if we ex um, explore this further. Second here is a new utility users tax. Adhere and if we adhered to the former tax rate structure, uh, revenue generation would be between 1.8 million to 5.8 million annually. And that's at the the lower end charging 1% across the board at uh, the upper, it's for maximum tax rates based on the different service providers. Third is the sales tax increase between 0.25% or 0.5%. Our current sales tax is 9.375%. Uh, 10 cities, including Menlo Park in the county are at that level. Uh, <coughs> the other half of the cities are above that level. 
And the bulk of them are at the maximum tax rate at 9.875%. Two cities are at 9.625%. And then finally, we have our business license tax. Right now, additional analysis is needed to really estimate the uh, revenue generating potential of revisions to that tax. So we, we can come back to the city council with more information if directed. On the next slide, um, this is the chart that I hope to use to facilitate a discussion with council. Um, and what you will see is um, a list of our strategies, brief notes, and then some information on council direction. Uh, I would like to highlight three measures that we are really seeking um, direction on tonight. And the first is the American Rescue Plan Act um, because it is in the proposed budget as recorded revenue. However, the city does have until December 2024 to spend the funds. So we can also revisit this topic at a later time too over the course of the fiscal year. The next is the additional uh, unfunded accrued liability contribution. Um, since uh, the staff proposal to suspend this payment for now uh, differs from the city council adopted budget principle, we would seek direction on, on your thoughts on that. And then finally, uh, the uh, potential revenue generating measures, we'd like to explore them a little more tonight and potentially at the next city council meeting as well. But um, I'm happy to facilitate that discussion uh, after the, the conclusion of the presentation. In terms of next steps, um, staff will incorporate any feedback uh, received from the city council into the proposed budget for adoption on June 27th. We will also update our general fund five-year forecast and uh, with new assumptions if directed. And just a reminder that our proposed budget is available fully online through OpenGov on our website, menlopark.gov slash budget. So we are happy to um, jump into the budget strategies discussion if desired by council. Thank you, um, Mr. Stolte and Ms. Mello for your presentation. And thank you to all of the staff that were involved in the preparation of this budget. We know it was a tremendous amount of work as it is every year. And we appreciate all of the thought that has gone into this. Um, I have a clarifying question on um, basically probably that last chart. It seems like some of these strategies are incorporated in the budget and some are not incorporated in the budget. Would you mind going through line by line so we can note which ones are in and which ones are kind of on the sure. table? Thank you, Judy. So the first one with American Rescue Plan Act, it is currently in the budget proposed, um, recorded as revenue. However, like I noted, there's still time throughout um, the fiscal year to revisit that topic. Sure, and this is just so that the numbers that we're seeing that yield yes. that 0.9 okay. million bal negative balance right. or whatever, we know which um, assumptions are cooked into that. Okay, so ARPA is one. The next is unfunded accrued liability contribution, which is suspended. There is one service level re reduction with uh, contract services for transportation on-call support. That's $35,000 in savings that was proposed in the budget. And that's it. Is the CIP, um, the or is that for the five-year forecast? The, so the CIP contribution is maintained in this proposed budget for fiscal year 24, but in the following years, it's reduced to 1 million. Um, so, so I guess it's, I have a two-part question. Okay. <laughs> so which ones are baked into this year's budget, which you just went over, and then yeah. which ones are baked into the five-year forecast? The five-year forecast includes the reduction in CIP contribution. It also includes the uh, suspension and then a reduced contribution for unfunded accrued liability in outer years. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Solte. Um, are there other clarifying questions from the council before we um, open the public hearing? Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you. Um, my question is with the one-time payment, I believe this is from Facebook, is that is that the last payment or is this just one of a few? Yeah. 
In terms of the uh, one-time fund, Fund 111, is, if that's uh, what the question is being directed to, there's multiple um, agreements with uh, funding that enters into that fund. Um, For Fund 111? If that's the one you're asking about, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. But the same amount or is it different? Um, I will ask Marvin Davis, our interim finance director, if he has any information on that. Thank you. He's on Zoom. And uh, good evening, Council, and uh, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, the one-time fund. It's uh, it includes uh, agreements that will probably go on about another five years at the same amount. So we should receive about 1.3 million for the next five years. And I think there are two or three agreements that make that up. And so even though it's called one time, it is, it should go on for maybe, I think three or maybe four or five years uh, for that particular fund. And the mayor and vice mayor, if I could just chime in as well. I think it's, um, Mr. Davis is accurate in terms of, I think, minimum five years, but some of them would continue on longer than that. Oh, okay. And so we, we can follow up with the council on the specifics across those, those three payments. Some do sunset sooner rather than later, but the largest amount, which I think is a, a million dollars a year, uh, has a much longer time frame. The, the, the amounts kind of vary from a million to 300,000 to 150,000. Um, so following up on that, Mr. Murphy, the 1 million that has a longer time frame, approximately how long is that time frame? Um, it, um, it's uh, contingent upon uh, one other item. So it could be it could be in, indefinitely or it could terminate at some point. Ha happy to follow up on the specifics. Okay, Th thank you. Um, um, I'm seeing a question from a clarifying question from Council Member Dorr, please. Thank you. Um, there are potential revenue generating ballot measures mentioned on page H 1.3 and it lists a lot of ranges for different potential ballot measures or revenue options. And I'm curious uh, why those ranges were chosen as opposed to other ranges. Thank you for the question for transient occupancy tax. The range of one to 3.5% increase was based on initial research on what other cities were charging. So um, for example, there's another city in San Mateo County that's at 13%. So we, we based our minimum increase at 1%. We also know that Palo Alto, for example, is at 15.5%. So we, we went up to 3.5% for the initial estimates. For sales tax, um, the maximum increase of 0.5% is where we would max out in our capacity to increase sales tax without special approval from the state legislature. So that's why some of the other cities in San Mateo County are maxed out at that rate at 9.875. And then utility users tax, we just mimicked what was in our former tax um, just as a, as a way to provide some initial estimates. But you know, if we pursued that, we, we could engage with an expert consultant to to design that tax in a different way. And um, jumping off the revenue question, so it looks like you're ultimately looking kind of for potent, if we are interested in pursuing that strategy, um, we obviously only have preliminary research here, um, but you're looking to find out the top two that speak to us that we think that would be of interest to the community? And then would we be potentially pursuing multiple measures or would be looking to narrow it ultimately to one? So it, it would be ideal to have ta a top two to explore and, and investigate more um, around viability and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and and we would want to, to just focus on two measures. Um, that does not have to be decided tonight. Uh, you, you can think about it, but if at the June 27th meeting, there are more thoughts about it, we could discuss then too. And if, if two measures do kind of rise to the top, what staff would do is initi initiate the research. 
and plan out the next year and a half or so, you know, um, really year of work that would go into the, the ballot measure. Um, so if, if there are thoughts tonight, we're, we're completely open to hearing them. And then um, given our knowledge of staff capacity and resource constraints, um, would that become almost a new priority and kind of, because that obviously would probably take a lot of staff time. So I guess, would there be um, consequences to other projects being driven probably from the city managers or the administrative services departments? I would say that this topic is so important. <laughs> so um, we're willing to prioritize, but there, there are impacts of course, to other work, work plan items. Okay, thank you. Um, any other clarifying questions before the public hearing is open? I'm not seeing any. So um, at this point, I would like to open the public hearing. City Clerk Heron, can you please call for public comment on this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item H1, public hearing on proposed fiscal year 2023, 24 budget and capital improvement plan. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Our first speaker will be James Pistorino, followed by Adina Levin. I'm back. Um, I feel like I'm channeling former council person Mickey Winkler here with many of my uh, comments. Um, with regard to the budget, I thought one thing that might help, um, many members of the public may not be aware that every year the city prepares a comprehensive annual financial report. I'm not sure if all the city council members are aware of that. At the back of the report, um, it has a series of nice graphs, which look at the economic conditions of spending and revenue by Menlo Park over a 10 year period. And I thought it might help folks. Um, the presentation by the city looked at a five-year period, but 10 years might be more instructive. So if you look at a 10-year period, um, the population of Menlo Park has essentially been flat. Menlo Park has had about 33,500 and 33,750 residents, depending upon which year you look and whether you use this census statistics or the city of Menlo Park. So the population has been flat. In uh, 2012 and in 2013, the city of Menlo Park had 229.75 FTEs, as reflected in the comprehensive annual report. Today, you heard a budget um, asking for 296 FTEs. So with the population flat, um, the city is um, will be, if the budget is adopted as it is, have, um, that re represents a 28% increase in the staff. So, um, again, if you look back at the budgets and the, the information provided in the comprehensive report, in 2012, the city had about 50 million in general fund revenue. In 2013, it was about 54 million. Last year, it was 81 million. So when you look at it, you say, geez, that's about 30 something million. Where did the money go? Now you know, at least a darn good chunk of it is uh, about a one third, 28% increase in staffing levels. Well, the population stayed constant. Um, other components of it, you know, where that's being spent. Currently, the council spending five million on an experimental solar electric water heater for the pool and other things at the Menlo Park uh, Community Center. You talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you're going to spend 250 grand more and vote to uh, rescind the noise ordinance to try to make that work. Um, I note in the current budget, um, I had. Um, the city was proposing to spend $978,000 for EV chargers at city buildings. Um, the city was proposing to spend $700,000 to replace roofs, not because they're out of date or need repair, it's to replace roofs so they can accept solar panels. So again, if you just look at it, the city does not have a revenue problem. The city's got a spending problem. The city is profligate, just spends too much. So when I hear these proposals that the city is going to try to raise more revenue, which I noted at the, um, I think it was the April 25th city council meeting, council persons Wollison and Dorr 
express their excitement about raising more revenue, more taxes on the citizens. If the council pursues an effort to try to raise more revenue, I think as opposed to other times, the council should expect opposition. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Adina Levin, and this will be the final call for public comment on our public hearing item H1. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council members, Adina Levin, Menlo Park resident, and uh, wanted to uh, 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 say a few things about the uh, budget. Um, so, uh, the, like overall, um, the uh, the overall budget uh, does look uh, fairly. Uh, reasonable to me, um, including um, some of the uh, spending going in to open up the new community center in Belhaven, uh, the anti-displacement planning, um, which is welcome, and um, the tree canopy planning, uh, which is also welcome. Um, so unfortunately, as the staff has presented, uh, the road ahead is uh, looking kind of rocky. and. Um, the, uh, and uh, in, in particular, due to administrative issues in previously, um, there it was a, uh, a lack of reauthorization of the utility users tax. Um, and um, so there's a gap in the revenue. Uh, meanwhile, the city council is, um, there are priorities that are happening uh, now moving forward with um, affordable housing and housing element. Um, uh, with uh, street safety, where the investments to help uh, keep us safe. Um, there's some things that are moving forward now and you know more things in the capital improvement um, moving forward as well. Um, and um, in particular, uh, next week, there's gonna be a study session on the environmental justice and safety element um, with the potential for the city to prioritize um, things relating to climate resilience. Um, and stormwater uh, and um, other investments that will uh, keep the community uh, 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 safe over time and address um, uh, environmental injustices over time. And um, so I would uh, do support uh, looking forward at what it is of the priorities that the city would want to invest in, including EJ environmental justice, and housing and to consider the revenue uh, uh, potential um, to address those needs. And the you know, reason that we have local government includes providing um, you know, services um, that uh, provide us with uh, a safe community that provide us with uh, you know, library services, um, uh, other services, and addressing the uh, community's uh, values with housing and environmental justice. So I would uh, uh, do hope that the city council does prioritize that discussion going forward. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Pam Jones, followed by Jenny Michelle. Good evening, uh, this is Pam Jones, resident of Menlo Park. Um, I like to be consistent. And so I, in previous budgets, I have asked about um, overtime, but the way that for the police department, but the way the budget is done, um, the overtime is not separated from you know, general wages um, and salaries. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is I think it, at the time I was told that the overtime is generally the cost of mutual aid. And uh, which I'm fine with mutual aid, but I think it's important for us to know exactly how much money it costs the city of Menlo Park um, to provide uh, mutual aid. And it would also be nice to know um, exactly where we are required to um, provide mutual aid. Don't wanna stop it, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the cost. So period on that one. Um, the second thing is, um, as I mentioned before, your first time looking at the environmental justice and safety element will be next um, next Wednesday. 
And, and so it's hard to uh, earmark money specifically for programs that you don't know whether or not they're going to exist. Uh, we know there will be something, uh, but it looks like that may not even begin until um, later on in the year. But I would like to note that the environmental justice and safety elements are actually part of four of the five top priorities. Um, housing, well, I don't need to say anything about that. Emergency preparedness, um, that also includes, in my mind, the, um, uh, the smoke that, that District uh, uh, 5 has to be concerned with and possible wildfires because they're so close, as well as how um, it sits down at the lower area in the Bill Haven neighborhood. And, and so certainly that's a, um, a piece that we need to pay attention to and look at whether or not we should be doing mitigations throughout the city in order to, um, uh, uh, to have the healthiest population that we can. Uh, climate action, well, I believe part of that is with electrification. And since we are uh, so gung-ho on electrification, that too needs to be considered a part of the um, environmental justice and safety element. And the last one is safe streets and um, uh, low-hanging fruit. I could, that's an area we could look for that we may be able to um, actually address one or two items in the, um, in the, in the uh, elements, the environmental justice and safety elements. So. Um, look forward to how you figure out how we're all able to figure out, not you, but all of us, and how to um, actually make a difference when it comes to these two areas that we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Jenny Michelle, followed by Randy Avalos. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, <clears throat> neighbors, and members of the public. My name is Jenny Michelle from the Coleman Place Neighborhood Block, longtime renter on Willow Road, mom of IEP student, recovering homeless teacher, childhood sexual assault survivor, by trade a commercial property manager, City Clerk Judy fan club member, and bringing you bad news tales from the exhausted and leveraged labor crypt Note, I was unable to make the budget workshop last week. Side comment, staff, you are wonderful. Great work. Dealing with a shortfall is never fun, especially as more residents ask for funds to projects not in the annual priorities. I support further increasing staff to support the city infrastructure and assisting us in meeting our obligations, especially to the state. Your daily workload that you carry is daunting and I applaud you. Our collective needs have shifted over the years and the assumption needs to be moving forward that we will increase our financial load as we progress through our various cycles and face an unstable climate. It's like making adjustments at halftime, right? Okay, my comment, safe street. Although I, I understand through lived experience types of poverty, or what it's like to live without necessary goods and services, to know yourself in a manner that is usually unbecoming, I must call out the impact of the trending local bike thefts. Because the neighbor's amazing electric bike was stolen, we stopped our lives and sold our electric bike the same weekend. No longer can our family motor down the streets and be mobile with a minimal footprint. To remedy this, I suggest a program. Everybody gets a bike, yeah. My rough pitch, the city could require that all companies performing business within our jurisdiction, who therefore should have a business license, would need to annually declare by way of the renewal or similar to a TDM, know, uh, know how companies outsource their physical labor. Ask directly how many employees work and live within the city. Of those employees, how many drive, take transit, bike, etc. Create a scale to incentivize companies to source local labor who use non-single-use vehicles. Those funds could then pay for everyone gets the bike program. Yeah. So the bike theft reduces. If company gives uh, bikes away, they get discounted business license fees in other areas, et cetera. 
Anyway, I thought you guys were doing great work. That was just my idea that I wanted to throw out there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Randy Avalos, followed by Catherine Dumont. Uh, good evening, City Council. Randy Avalos, District 5. I hope everybody's doing well this evening. So just to reiterate, there's you know economic uncertainty on the horizon. Um, it could be quite rough waters coming up, and that's going to affect residents non-uniformly. Um, just same thing with inflation. Oh, Mr. Some Avalos, can you please speak a little louder? Sure. How's that? Great. Perfect. So um, there's economic uncertainty coming up on the horizon. It's going to affect residents non-uniformly. The distribution is going to be different, just as inflation is going to be different with residents as well. Um, some struggle to put food on the table, and some are just inconvenienced. It's part of our, our city. So with that uncertainty on the horizon, residents are going to have to tighten their belts. I hope the city tightens its belt as well, instead of forcing hardships on uh, residents who are struggling, or maybe struggling in the future here. So, um, you know, the staff considers the economic stabilization fund a priority. Uh, it's kind of important for emergency funds when there's rough seas ahead. I hope the city considers their priority as well. Thank you for your time. Take care. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Catherine Dumont, followed by Susan Connolly. Good evening, Catherine Dumont calling. Um, just want to address the council and mayor uh, about the um, challenges of, of um, uh, increasing challenges of, uh, of, a, of all the new programs that are being um, added, in particular um, programs that address the inequities of the past, um, such as the environmental harms and the housing programs um, that have been um, uh, have marginalized um, so many in our community, and the importance of those of staffing for those, um, proactively addressing. Um, uh, uh, climate action, including measures to get us to net zero, um, and the um, the county mental health response program. Uh, so these are all uh, incredibly worthy um, programs, and I realize that uh, staffing needs an increase, not just with population, but with the complexity of the programs that are being administered and responding to the um, state, uh, county, and local requirements. Um, so I um, understand that that's a given as well. So I just want to uh, support the work that's being done at the city level and un with an understanding that um, uh, that there are a lot of uh, needs to juggle and appreciate the work that you guys are doing and the staff is doing um, to make things work with what you've got. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker will be Sue Connolly, followed by Brian Baskin. Hello, City Council. Um, this is Sue Connolly, and um, I wanted just in a uh, Menlo Park resident. Um, I, I'm I'm passing on information that I heard recently from one of the new members of the Finance Commission. But there might be some places where Menlo Park can take advantage of uh, state and federal funding that we might not be currently availing ourselves of. Um, I'm not knowledgeable about it, but I thought it was positive news that bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, adding that to the table here, I believe the Finance Commission is going to be looking into opportunities for that, but um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention if you're not aware of that, that there are some things that Menlo Park, based on one um, new financial uh, commissioner's uh, research, that we can 
apply for, you know, grants and, and other sources of funding. And then, of course, as we all do when times are tough, we look and go, you know, what can we forego? You know, the kind of the belt tightening kind of a thing. Um, I'm in favor of that in view of, you know, looking at the priorities and especially for, you know, those who are most vulnerable in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next up is Brian Baskin. Hello, this is Brian Baskin, a longtime Menlo Park resident. Uh, thank you to the council for all of your hard work and for putting the budget together. Uh, my comment is a pretty simple one. It's that is um, is supporting the proposal put forth by our police officers uh, for the measures in there to add incremental security measures, um, which I think were license plate readers, and there was another one similar to that. Um, all these things were obviously a wealthy community with a large budget, which is, you know, is something. There's obviously a lot of things that are pulling on resources, but at the core, uh, uh, safety in our great town is priority. It's priority above everything. And I think without safety, we have very little. Um, and so I think it's critical that we support our police officers and anything they believe can uh, improve safety in our community is paramount. And I think especially when we're in this budget tightening period, um, I think it forces us to triage what's important. And ours is a vocal support for our police and for measures they feel will keep us safe. We are very much in support of that. Thanks so much. Thank you for your comment. I am seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen, and thank you to the members of the public who provided us with comment this evening. And with that, I will now close the public hearing and open this topic up for City Council discussion. So would somebody like to kick things off? Um, actually, I'm uh, fielding a request for a five minute break. So um, we'll have the opportunity to gather our thoughts and we'll reconvene at 7.55. We're gonna make it seven minutes, 7.55, thank you.
All right. Having our city council back at our virtual and in-person dais, Mayor Willison, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, and thank you everyone for that short break. So when we left off, we had concluded the public hearing and brought the conversation back to the dais for council discussion. Um, would anyone like to kick us off? Mayor Wilson, this is uh, Drew Combs. Um, so I don't wanna kick us off, but I would like to just, uh, if we could have a reframing of what specifically staff is asking us for and, and what specifically they want to get out of, of this session. Thank you, council member Combs. Um, Mr. Stolte, um, do you wanna bring up that slide or um, address the question? So tonight we're looking for um, two things. One is feedback on the overall budget, including service level enhancements, um, as we move to prepare a, a more final version for June 27th. And then second is what's on the screen right now. And that's going through, especially the three budget strategies I highlighted earlier. If you have thoughts on some of the others, um, I'm happy to guide us through one by one on this chart as well. Does that answer your question, Council Member Combs? Great. I am still looking for um, Vice Mayor Taylor, please. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And, and I'll just start off uh, with the budget strategies because that's it's easier for me. Um, I am definitely not in support of a UUT tax. Um, in fact, the only thing on this list that I would be interested in is using, um, is potentially talking about increasing the TOT. And that would be by a ballot measure. Is that correct? Correct. Um, the other is just to get some clarity, the BMR funds, are those specific to production and potential staffing use or is it just for production or is it up to the city council? We're bringing up Deanna Chow, the Community Development Assistant Director. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Willison, Vice Mayor Taylor, and members of the City Council. Deanna Chow, Assistant Community Development Director. So our BMR funds are a somewhat restricted fund. We do collect our BMR fees through our commercial linkage program. Uh, they are used to support our NOFIS, our Notice of Funding Availability, so that does move uh, towards production of housing, preservation of housing, and it also does support some of our staff and our BMR administrator. So is, so is there any potential, uh, if we're looking at um, just production, is there a potential for using it for preservation? Yes, that is one of the items that BMR funds can be used for. That, as an example, was the most recent, the $1.2 million that the city council approved uh, for Habitat for Humanity to support rehabilitation loans in Bellhaven. And as far as protection, does it fund that as well, or is that something different? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I believe we can use that to support uh, like the creation of our anti-displacement strategies um, that have been identified as a priority in our housing element. What, what I would like to actually see is that we are putting more of our financial resources from the BMR in the anti-strategy, the anti-displacement strategy. Um, I just look at how, how much is being spent on what, and I think that number is too low, um, along with the um, suggested allocation for the DEI, uh, $53,000 to bring equity just seems a little... Um, small, I'll say. And let's see, trying to find, can you actually put up the chart? I'm not sure which, which page it's on, but it has the funding suggestions. Um, and this would be for feedback on budget. It would take me too long to flip through the pages. I don't think so, no. I think it's attachment F, possibly, or attachment E. Yes, this is it. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I'm just looking at the allocations for the DEI inclusion, 51,000. I'm also looking at, I do not see the anti-displacement on this list. So I'm assuming it's not listed under the service level enhancement, um, but that's some feedback on that number. And then also just thinking about the community wellness and crisis team, um, considering that we are, I'm just thinking about our, our youth and our young adults. Um, this number also seems small considering um, the mental health crisis and also the drug crisis, which is related to mental health. Um, so I'd like to see that number a little larger. And I'm not sure if it's the following attachment that has the anti-displacement money listed. It's attachment C. It's an attachment C, page 1.110. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so it does have that one on there. So I just, so that's my initial feedback. And the number for displacement would be the 187,000, and that's specific to staffing, but not necessarily a program that staffing would be implementing or. It's a, it also reflects an increase in contract services for that effort for anti-displacement. Oh, okay, okay. Um, additionally, uh, it, if I can follow up on some of the other items. Um, for, yes. For the DEI, um, 51,000, 50,000 is for um, the start of our DEI B initiative. And then $1,000 uh, is for the, um, their membership. So that's just, it's kind of startup cost for DEI initiative. And just a follow-up question, Mr. Stolte, is, is there um, at the county level with the work that they're doing when it comes to budgeting and equity, is, is there any discussion around, I don't know if there's a, an equation that you could figure out what that dollar number should be around budget when it comes to how to um, say service level enhancements, you wanna include that in an equity initiative, what that would look like. To me, that's why I say this number is small. I would think it would be more. We participate in countywide meetings where we collaborate with other cities in the county. And that subject hasn't come up just yet, but it's a really good point that we can take back to the next meeting we participate in and, and see, um, see if there are, if there's existing thinking out there. Thank you. And, and I'm not sure if now is the time to for the council to at least agree on maybe doing a set aside or earmarking funds that would be specific for that. Just listening to a few of the public comments when it comes to environmental justice, for me, it falls into that category. If, if we don't allocate it, then we don't have the funds when we actually start putting programming together. And since we're discussing the budget before we actually look at what the EJ element and the safety element suggests. So I'm thinking, how do we, how, how are we going to deal with that? So two parts uh, for the environmental justice element, as programs get into place, we can certainly come back to council for consideration and funding of those programs. Um, also, just as a reminder, through our annual budget process, there is a mid-year adjustment to the budget. So that is another opportunity if new um, projects come up that we could consider funding as well. Thank you. And um, just one final thing to follow up on your, on your comments, Vice Mayor, was the community uh, <clears throat> wellness and crisis response team mental health clinician. That um, $80,000 is just the first year um, city portion of funding for the mental health clinician that would be embedded in our police department. So that, that's just what that funding um, reflects. I just wanted to clarify that. And, and just a follow-up question, were there any other recommendations were made? I'm, I'm thinking specifically to our youth. Around mental health crisis, 
drug usage, just the things that unfortunately our teens are facing. So that um, we're talking with our police chief here, and that's certainly a discussion topic right now. It's going to be explored more with the county. Um, this is just kind of the initial startup for this first phase of the, of the pilot with the mental health clinician, but it's certainly something that um, I think most cities are prioritizing right now. So we'll hopefully um, have more discussions and bring, and bring more ideas back to council over time. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, would anyone else like to join in the conversation? Councilmember, oh, Councilmember Combs, please. Yeah, yeah. So happy to uh, provide some of my initial thoughts. Um, first, a question. Can um, I, I googled around and I, I don't know if I quite got the answer. I was looking. Can someone explain to me exactly what flock cameras are, um, and specifically how in Menlo Park we plan to use them? Yes, I'm happy to provide a, a high level overview. So the flock cameras would be fixed vehicle license plate reader cameras installed at strategic locations throughout the city. They also have built in gun shot uh, detection technology that would assist the police department in responding to um, safety incidents. And so we, we currently have license plate readers on some patrol cars, correct? And, and, and this would be providing cameras with similar abilities at six positions throughout the city. In discussing this with the chief, um, he identified that we have two vehicles that currently have the license plate reader technology. So this would be an expansion of that program. And do we know exactly where these cameras would be placed and how many we would be ordering them, how many we would order? I think for these detailed questions, I'll invite up Commander Moffitt. Good evening, council members, and thank you for the question. Uh, I believe what we've done up to this point in uh, preliminary research for potential implementation is uh, work with the vendor in, a, in association with uh, high traffic intersections, uh, areas uh, potentially that um, would intercept vehicles involved in crimes, those type of things. And we've identified approximately, I believe it's 36 locations throughout the city, uh, citywide, um, that would be um, based upon the recommendations from the vendor, uh, ideally suited, um, including a lot of uh, ingress and egress uh, points of traffic throughout the city. Um, we've had um, some preliminary discussion or overview of the, uh, the project and, and its capabilities in uh, subcommittee um, and eager to uh, have further discussion or answer any other questions you might have. Okay, um, th thanks um, for, for that. Um, th then moving on to, um, to, to it, it seems like as, as far as, and so I know that that represents uh, a one-time uh, uh, expense of, of essentially a million dollars. Um, and it seems as though the other major expense is related to uh, MPCC. Right, because I, I want to understand that um, all of the items that have MPCC uh, in front uh, in, in the uh, description before the colon are specifically hiring exclusively in connection with MPCC. Is, is, that, is that accurate? I would like to clarify. So if we are able to bring up the service level enhancement slide again, or visit attachment C. 
Um, some of these items are over multiple years. Um, so I apologize for the confusion. So we have our flock cameras, which is the cost of over two years and uh, our annual operations for Menlo Park is 1.2 million. So, um, and was there another item that was up? The fleet cameras is also a multi-year cost. So we would be happy to bring those back separately to identify first year versus the following year cost, if that would be helpful. So because if we're going back to the, 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 the cameras, um, you have 940,000 as the one time, I'm assuming sort of installation um, cost, and then you have 80,000 is ongoing. So are you saying that that's not accurate, that, that there is more ongoing costs than the 80,000 that's listed here? So in terms of the uh, flock camera LPR and gunshot detection system, um, that's a year one cost of $284,900 um, with an estimated recurring annual cost of approximately $251,000. Um, when it comes to the uh, in-car cameras, um, there is no uh, sizable onboarding cost. It's an average annual cost uh, with a proposed five-year contract of approximately $80,000 per year. And so the, the, the pricing that was shared earlier was for that aggregate cost. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be frank. I still don't know what, what is included in the $940,000. And maybe it's just me, and I don't want to want to uh, um, uh, stall or, or pause the discussion. Um, but I, I'm I'm looking at, at attachment C, and and I don't and I don't understand. I'll be frank. Um, what what the nine hundred and forty thousand um, dollars entails, um, and it's not an insignificant amount of money. And so I like further clarity uh, on that before I would be able to to actually provide any specific direction. Um, I also think that we, in connection, and I very much appreciate uh, Mr. Vaskin's er earlier comment, um, and, and safety is, is uh, a priority and, and always will be, but of course, um, there always has to be a balance um, between safety and, and issues of privacy and, and personal liberty. Um, we could put cameras on every corner and would make us safer, um, we have to ask ourselves, like, is that a community that we want? Um, and, and maybe it is, but that's a discussion that we need to have. And I don't know that we as a community have had that discussion. Um, and so I, I would want a substantive discussion. Uh, and, and if one has been had and I missed it, please, please feel free to correct me. But I would want a substantive discussion um, about this uh, a technology uh, before I have a discussion about the the budget and, and then I would have to understand the budget a little bit more than I have to admit I'm I, I'm understanding it at the moment. Um, so, so that would be my direction there. And and I, I don't want it to be a long night. So I'll I'll, I'll move on and moved on. And I, I just want to understand that for um, all of the items that have MPCC attached are listed in the description. Are those items specifically related to or exclusively related to the operation of, of MPCC? And, and does that represent, I, I did that total and that ongoing comes to essentially $2 million. Is, is, that, is that not accurate or is that, is that accurate? Because um, I, I guess that would be my first question because my, my math isn't, isn't adding up um, with I think uh, where, where staff is. So I have an ongoing MPCC expenses of $2 million, essentially. Is that accurate or not accurate? Yes, the, the 2 million would represent the increase in staffing costs, which would be ongoing, plus the ongoing operating costs, less the projected revenue of Great. 17 15 per year. And I think what I want to see is that I think, again, we all um, uh, are really excited and think that 
that MPCC will represent a great addition um, to the community. From my perspective, though, um, that excitement can't allow me to um, uh, com completely like uh, ignore um, expenses, uh, especially as they increase, and especially because uh, we are uh, a, a relatively small small city, and whether we are getting a little uh, ahead of ourselves, um, what I would want to see and, and, and understand, because I, I think that when it comes to these services already, like right, that there is, there was, and is continued at this moment a, a, a library in the the Bellhaven community, which will be transitioned to to MPCC, um, and of course these services essentially to some degree. Um, there are services that that uh, are, are provided there, um, and, and so what I would want to understand specifically is to, to what is the baseline of the services that have been provided with the Bellhaven Library, with the Oneida Harris Senior Center, and the other um, uh, community facilities over there. What that number is and what that represent, very specifically, and then getting some sense of of what comes with this this additional two million dollars? Um, because committing the city to two million dollars, and again, that number of course will grow over time because everything does. And so, if we look over the next ten years, um, that's twenty million dollars. And so, I I want to understand, but there is a baseline there. We're not starting from zero, and I want to understand very clearly what what that zero what, what that baseline is. Um, when it comes to the recreational services we provide, and library and community recreational services we provide, and what what the this this addition, what that total amount would be um, um, to running MPCC, because I think that that's going to be like really important to understand. Is is the base we're starting with two million, and then we're adding another two million. We're talking about four million a year. Um, I, I think that that I, I would need that information to provide further further direction um, there. And then I'll just wrap up, and I promise I'll be I'll be done on this topic for for, for the evening. Um, when it comes to additional revenue sources, and and I appreciate the staff um, outlining the, the ways in which um, some taxes, uh, in which Menlo Park um, is, is uh, you know, Menlo Park's rate are, are less than than others, suggesting that there there room room to grow. Um, but uh, again, all of these tax measures uh, represent going to the voters. And I think we have to um, recognize that um, what's the moment in time that we're going to go to voters um, asking for more money. And irrespective of whether, you, you know, Redwood Cedar or San Mateo or whatever has a higher rate than us, if we're going and asking um, at a time when, when people are, are, inflation is high, um, and overall struggling, I, I think that the reception, uh, irrespective of how we compare ourselves to other cities, is is not going to be great. So I, I think that that has to be taken into mind, and that makes me um, fairly skeptical of of tax raising measures. That doesn't mean I'm I will take any off the table completely, whether it's the UUT or or, or or the TLT or others for consideration. But I do think we have to be mindful. It's not just that it may be less than other communities. It is, are we, is this a moment in time we really feel that we can go to voters and ask them to, to pay to pay more money? Um, uh, so, so those are, are, are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Combs. Um, Councilmember Nash, please. Thank you. So sort of, Moving on from what uh, Council Member Combs was saying, um, I also have some questions about the policing. I thought that the 80,000 was actually the, that's listed under ongoing costs. I thought that was actually the community wellness and crisis response team. Is That, that is correct. I, I think the grouping under this category is causing confusion. So we can certainly come back with an updated attachment that doesn't group the items to help outline the one-time startup costs versus the annual costs for each item. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, because it sounds like there are ongoing costs for the cameras, which have not been possibly not been reflected here. And along those lines, I think it would be helpful to um, have a study session 
in the future to discuss this before we actually would go through implementation um, and better understand exactly how this um, would work with citywide in our community and also the um, safety versus the privacy trade-offs and just how that works. Also, I was, I've been looking at um, local communities around many of whom have imp recently implemented the locked cameras and noted that on um, in one of the cities, they're saying that they had a large increase in staff time required to be re reviewing the, uh, the data that's coming from the cameras. So I'm curious when we do have a study session, how that plays into it, or if, we're, if we have some different setup. Um, regarding the MPCC, I am wondering, given that we have a large number of um, staff already committed to in the library and community services area, to the, I really appreciate the org chart that you presented. Thank you. And given that between library, recreation, and sports, we have um, about 28 personnel, how could that possibly, is there any way we could allocate that um, and use some of those resources? Again, also with what Councilmember Combs said, um, we do have people already in the Bellhaven Library serving there. How can we um, look at this in a way that we, are, we possibly don't increase the headcount? Um, I also note that um, the LCS supervisor that's being requested, um, I thought that we just changed um, titles and a few meetings ago to actually have someone in a supervisor position there. Um, and so how is this different than what we just approved a few a few meetings ago? I, I can help clarify that. Thank so you. There was an update to our salary schedule, which lists the classification titles and, and compensation. The item that came before you in the recent months was updating the classification titles only to library and community services supervisor and um, or actually supervisor was already incorporated. The, the manager and the assistant director were updated uh, recently to reflect the, the new organization or the revised organizational structure from 2020. Um, but that did not add any full-time equivalents. That was just a salary schedule amendment to adjust the titles. It didn't impact the FTEs. I understand that, thank you. Um, but I thought that the, the library and community services supervisor was specifically to work at MPCC and oversee the operations. I'm inviting up Sean Reinhardt, our director of library and community services. Thank you for the question, council member. The, um, Update to the salary schedule to create the new classification um, is necessary to assist with the planning preparations and general operations and oversight of the Menlo Park Community Campus, as well as operations across the city related to recreation, sports, library services. So certainly is needed in that regard. And as you may recall, it was um, also included the creation of a assistant library and community services director uh, position um, to uh, kind of underscore that. Um, what is before you here in this proposal is really about a supervisor specifically for that new facility and campus. So really kind of the day-to-day -day operational oversight as opposed to that more strategic management service delivery uh, programming uh, across the city. And in particular focused on the MPCC right now. Isn't it advertised right now as a library, as the MPCC supervisor in the job opportunities? Certainly the fact that the new facility is about to open and we're deeply involved in the planning for operating that new facility, including all of the policies, getting the staff, uh, assuming that the city council authorizes additional staff and, and, and standing up that new facility, the manager, 
that's currently advertised would be a key part of that team. Thank you. Um, so I guess I would be interested in seeing how, is there a way to not increase staff, um, certainly by six headcount, um, where we could, um, realizing it may dilute the services to some extent, but what would that look like? Um, I do hesitate to add six additional people um, to run the center. I realize we've talked about a lot of enhancements um, as being on the um, subcommittee that's the MPC subcommittee. Um, certainly there's a lot of really exciting work going on in MP, um, projected for the MPCC. I don't want to um, change that, but I'm just wondering, is there a way to utilize the current staffing in a different way. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So to answer specifically the question, there are ways they would result in a lower level of service at the new facility as well. Probably it would entail a lower level of service at other facilities across the city, because what the Menlo Park Community Campus essentially is, is, is it's a brand new multi-service facility with five major service components involved in it. So it's certainly an increase in um, uh, like the capacity that we you know we would need to operate something like that at the level that the city council and the community have envisioned for it. I would also note that it really is more of a restoring uh, a facility and a campus that was there before uh, the Oneta Harris Community Center, which was comprised of multiple components. Um, it's uh, the beginning of the construction of the new facility happened to coincide with the pandemic and some of the reductions in full-time equivalent staffing that you saw earlier in the presentation. I would note that prior to the pandemic, the library and community services department while operating um, the Oneta Harris Community Center, as well as all of the things that we're operating now, had 71 full-time equivalent personnel. Uh, currently, the department has 66.25 full-time equivalent personnel. So by adding six, we would basically be getting to, uh, let's see, 72.25 full-time equivalent personnel, just slightly more than existed for the pandemic when the Oneta Harris Community Center was fully operational. So we're really talking about kind of restoring what was there before and adding a little bit, not really a pretty, not really a big substantial expansion per se. Thank you. Um, I honestly am still interested in seeing, is there a way to, um, how would it look if we were to try to staff the center with um, our current headcount, realizing that um, you can't pull people from the preschool child development, for example, there's several areas where um, we it's, it's pretty we need to have that stable workforce. But if we were to um, look at sharing some of the services across the campuses um, or or moving some of the services across campuses, just is that possible before we go ahead and add six more people, um, six new headcount? Um, we will be, oh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weinhardt, didn't we add, I wanna say either four or six FTE within the past budget year? Yes, thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, I believe the City Council authorized adding 5.75 full-time equivalent, and that was to restart the Gymnastics Center. And then what is our existing vacancy rate? Specific to LCS. Our overall vacancy rate is 14% currently. I would have to look and bring that back to you for the vacancy rate specific to LCS. We can bring Thank, that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. So just going down this list, um, I still would like more information about the MPCC and is there any way we could um, make that work? The anti-displacement strategies, I'm, I support. Um, I note that Palo Alto has just started a rental registry and would love to see whether there's any way we could um, piggyback on that or look at how that is happening, um, realizing that um, we don't have a robust housing staff right now, but maybe we could just keep an eye on how they're um, doing that. And I believe that is being funded by an outside um, agency. Um, I'd like to see more about the police um, patrol and communications. Um, I would be willing to put this, to keep this in the budget, but to not actually spend it without um, having a study session and um, really knowing much more about what is going on and what the trade-offs are. Um, the equipment for zero emissions landscaping, I support, we will talk about that soon. Um, I do um, support the planning commissioner stipends and the electric gardening rebate program I'd like to talk about um, in the next, um, in the Zell um, discussion. And I appreciate and um, support the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives. Um, and then as far as the raising um, strategies for uh, potential generating, um, revenue generating measures, um, I think that the transit occupancy tax is something that would be worth looking at. Um, at this time with the economic environment, I am not in favor of proceeding with a new U, uh, UUT or a sales tax increase. Um, the business license tax, I'm curious about. I certainly do not want to do anything that would hit our small businesses. Um, I think that they are, um, but if we were to look at something that might, um, I don't know if it's worth looking at something that might um, be for larger employers um, or not, but that would be the only way that I would be interested in that. And even that I'd want to really think about. So I think um, I'm the one that I'm most, um, would most support would be the transit occupancy tax. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. Um, Council Member Dorr. Thank you. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to city staff for putting all the work into this and for helping us as a city reflect and celebrate all the fantastic work that is going on, uh, whether that's building out the new MPCC, thinking about how to improve uh, sound pollution issues along the Caltrain corridor, thinking about improving our streets, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to happen, and I appreciate the ongoing uh, commitment that staff have for our city. Um, I really appreciated uh, my fellow council members and the conversation so far. I uh, Could we go back to the other page, please? On the screen, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, I too am curious to hear a little bit more, um, maybe at, at the June 27th conversation about potential options with MPCC, particularly thinking about the gym program, if we've added in about five FTEs right now, um, would love to know at that next meeting a little bit more about uh, the, why the need for additional two staff, um, especially because uh, gym, gymnastics are not uh, 20, you know, a, a nine to five, maybe it is. Uh, but to understand what those sessions might look like and if maybe particularly there, if there's a place to make a reduction. Um, I share Council Member Combs' curiosity around the police patrol and would like to see that in more detail and in conversation. I think unlike Council Member Nash, I would want to see that before including it in the budget at greater detail. Um, and those are my comments there. And on the next page, back to the other one, thinking about uh, revenue opportunities. Um, I am most interested in exploring increasing the TOT, the, um, the TOT, yes, and maybe the business license tax uh, 
but I share a concern of making wanting to make sure that this did not put any hardship whatsoever on our local small businesses. Um, one curiosity I have, and uh, something that I've talked about in previous conversations about excitement around exploring revenue, is, is that there's a lot of federal money that's available to support work in communities uh, around the country, particularly through the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act that came through, um, the IRA and the IIJ for their acronyms. And there's a lot of funding there uh, that I am curious about, and I think that might be relevant for our city. I'm really glad that we did ARPA and that we explored Measure T, K, I mean, uh, and we're exploring different funding opportunities. And I think that there are, might be more opportunities for us to look at in the IRA and the IIJA, um, because those funds can help uh, fund improvements in roads and bridges, uh, deploy zero emission transit, EV charging, um, maybe because part of it also looks at affordable housing, could it support us doing more and or helping cover what we already have for the anti-displacement strategies? And I'll note that uh, both of those have a Justice 40 requirement that says 40% of the funds have to go into Justice 40 communities. Uh, and there is a, a map tracker system and it shows that exactly Bellhaven is one of those communities that quali qualifies. So it is even, uh, there's money that's earmarked for communities like Bellhaven, where we can bring in extra resources to help cover costs that we already have in our budget uh, and maybe help us do even more. And so would like us to be exploring that. And maybe um, if you don't have thoughts on, on connection points at this meeting, uh, would welcome to hear if you do, but if not, uh, would love to continue the conversation on June 27th or in future conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, Council Member Nash, you said you had a follow-up question. Oh, comment. Oh, oh, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, so I will share my initial thoughts and I appreciate everyone's comments and let me see my notes here. Um, so I, um, I agree that we need to have a larger conversation about the flock cameras um, and uh, whether, I'm not sure whether we should include it or not. Um, so I, I know council member Dorr was not wanting to include it. Council member Nash said we could include it. So I'm curious to hear what my colleagues think. Um, council members uh, Combs and vice mayor Taylor about that. Um, Regarding um, the youth and teen mental health, um, I was reflecting to myself um, that we do have um, the community funding grant program um, that we do at the end of the year. Um, and I know we tend to um, give quite broadly to different community organizations, which is a beautiful thing. Um, perhaps that's, uh, an opportunity for us to maybe have some more narrow focus and maybe come up with some themes um, for the year and priorities around where to give that money. Um, because while I think we um, grant that money to a lot of fabulous organizations, um, I think there might be an opportunity there to reallocate some of those funds. Um, so that would be a future conversation. Um, in terms of environmental justice um, and future budget amendments. I am very much aware that we may have more expenses that we need to account for as the year goes on and as we have further conversations, um, which leads me to just thinking about um, not just this coming year and our projected deficit of almost a million dollars, but kind of our five-year projection and our drawing down on our reserves um, and about how Structurally, we really need to be keeping up um, and balancing our checkbook basically and making sure that our operating costs are covered by our revenues. Um, and so, um, in terms, so I'm really looking at kind of ongoing costs. Um, and I would be open to um, more service level reductions that staff was um, suggesting on slide 37 from this evening. Um, some median landscaping, reduced park maintenance. Um, if that's a, a viable recommendation that staff thinks would not greatly impact our residents. Um, 
especially given, I think people's more openness to brown things um, with our being used to drought conditions. Um, I think that might be an opportunity to save some money. Um, uh, if there are other opportunities that are kind of on the, the fringes of that um, residential experience that are ongoing opportunities to save money, I'd be open to those as well. Um, I join uh, council member Nash with her um, desire to understand um, whether there's an opportunity in library and community services to repurpose some existing positions. Um, I get the library and community services newsletter every week and it is incredible the breadth of program offerings that we offer, um, like cooking and seeds and all kinds of amazing, wonderful things. And I'm always a little bit curious about how um, utilized those programs and services are. Um, and whether that's the best use of our um, limited resources. So I don't know, it's perhaps the very popular programs and that's something highly um, desired by the community. I, I don't know, but um, when we're looking to really launch this new center, um, especially for a neighborhood that hasn't um, always been top of mind, I think I'd rather, if I'm thinking of where to allocate the resources. Um, so I'd be um, curious, if there is an opportunity again, I hate to say those are like fringe things, but if there's an opportunity to um, look at priori prioritizing those services that we're offering our residents. I don't get a, I get a lot of emails about like gymnastics or swimming, or there's some key programs that I think the community depends on um, and others that I, I don't hear much about. Um, just going through this. So um, looking at, um, can you please go back to the service enhancement slide? Um, so I've already mentioned the MPCC thing, the anti-displacement strategies, um, confirming with staff that this is general fund money um, being used for these. Um, is that correct? The service enhancements are coming from the general fund. I believe so, but I'd like to bring um, Marvin Davis to help answer this question. Yeah. Good evening, Council. Yes, these are uh, these are general fund contributors, and also um, the ongoing uh, expense. Uh, provided that the council would receive the revenue would be about 1.6 million. That would be the ongoing, provided that the revenue uh, stream will be stable. Okay. Once you take the revenues and you minus the expenses. Yeah, the, minus the okay. yes, minus um, the right, ongoing. Are, the, okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So I, following up on Vice Mayor Taylor's question about the BMR fund and the anti-displacement strategies, um, given how time sensitive it is to prevent the displacement of existing residents, um, I'd either be open to um, using BMR funds um, for anti-displacement measures, um, or if the budget requires to, um, Either, either to add in money uh, from the BMR fund or to um, use that money instead of the general fund money for anti-displacement measures. Um, I'm very much in support of the rental registry, which is a little beyond the scope of the budget conversation, but I was watching Palo Alto as well. Um, and I agree with my colleagues. Um, can you please now go to the strategy slide? Okay, so if we're first talking about the revenue generation, which again, um, the reason I believe this is a path we need to go down is because I think our community and our residents have very high expectations and um, we offer a high level of service for our residents that I think is highly valued in our community. And at the end of the day, we have to pay for it. 
um, and we can cut expenses to a certain degree, but those expenses are gonna start impacting the services we can provide. So um, I agree that TOT, especially since we're on the low end is, is prime um, for exploration. I'm a little um, hesitant to be overly prescriptive on some of the others because I don't, I'm not an expert on um, ballot measures and on um, appetite and timing of different things given inflation and all the other concerns that my colleagues have raised. So um, I might be looking for more staff guidance a little bit on some of these um, other measures. It definitely sounds like there's massive council consensus around TOT, um, but for the others, um, I would like to see if you have any further recommendations. Um, going back to some of the other things on here, um, in terms of using the ARPA dollars, which you've already done to balance our budget, I don't really see us having a choice in that matter um, because if we don't, then we're looking for another 3.7 million. Um, so I, I feel like we kind of had a, like I had a, a hope that we would, I don't know, not be exactly in this financial position um, that we can have a different conversation around the ARPA, but I'm, I'm supportive of using it. Um, again, I'm very concerned about future prospects about the CIP and the unfunded pension liability and drawing down on all of our reserves. I think previous councils um, have set up certain policies to maintain our infrastructure, to pay off our unfunded liabilities, to be in the position um, for a global pandemic or another economic um, recession. And it makes me really nervous to, um, to decimate those um, those policies. And so um, I think we need to continue to think about how we're gonna keep up with our expenses. Um, and um, I also, in terms of the one-time developer payments, um, I think that fund 111, um, to me that money, maybe you can explain more about what the intent of that money was, um, but I my feeling is it's to be used um, in the Bayfront area or in the areas impacted by that development. And so to me, using it potentially for the MPCC, I feel like there's a, a nexus there. Um, I very much wanna hear from Vice Mayor Taylor and my colleagues on that. Um, and yes, the master fee schedule um, updating, although it seemed like that would be a long process and potentially not generate a ton. So if you, if staff thinks that's a worthwhile exercise, but it sounds like we were going to do it anyway. So, um, I think that those are my thoughts. Um, so I've kind of given around, everyone's kind of had their first pass at it. So I think we'll kind of do one more pass to see if anyone wants to jump off anyone else's comments. So um, if it's all right with everyone, I think we'll kind of go back through the way we came. Um, so Vice Mayor Taylor, do you have any new thoughts or comments based on others' thoughts? Thanks. Thank you, Mary Willison. And, and yes, I do. Um, and I appreciate the back and forth with the strategies and then the service level enhancements. Um, I am, if you can go to the, the service level enhancements, and now just go back and forth between these two. Thank you, Ms. Mello. Um, so I am supportive of having a study session um, on the flock cameras so that we all can get more information about what it would provide. Um, I think there's, there's opportunity to do a mid-year budget um, amendment um, if we all agree. Um, to to provide that service um, for our police department to be able to provide it for the public. As far as the additional FTEs um, at this moment, I, I agree with Councilmember Nash. Um, I am interested in knowing um, specifically what the old staffing levels were um, compared to the new, so that we know um, what that looks like, and then also. Um, Ms. Mello already provided the information around what our vacancy rate is there. Um, and then also, I think Mr. Reinhardt provided the information about the addition of the 5.75 FTEs. Um, I already shared my um, thoughts around the anti-displacement strategies. I do support the rental registry. Not sure how that will happen, but I do support it. 
Um, also, I do support the funds coming directly from BMR. Just looking at what our fund levels are, we definitely can afford to use that towards the anti-displacement strategies plus the FTEs. Not sure, 0.25, is that supposed to be two FTEs or 0.2? So just a part-time person. Okay. And let's see the next items on here. Um, supportive of the Planning Commission stipend, uh, the equipment for zero emissions. Um, also, I already commented on the, the DEI, um, definitely supportive of the electric gardening rebate program. And then going to the strategies, I um, already made a comment as far as I would support the TOT. Um, looking at TOT, I'm definitely not interested in increasing taxes for any residents. Um, nor businesses. Um, as far as the sales tax, that would be a combination of everyone paying an increase. Um, so not sure I, I would support that as well. Let's see, as far as the one-time um, developer payments, um, it'll be great to have more information just on um, fund 111, just to see what more we can do with it over the next five years um, of our expected um, forecast. And let's see, as far as the ARPA funds, um, when we received the funds, I think it's been two years since we received them the first time, the first payment, I believe. Um, I have always been in support of those funds being used on residents and resident services. Um, I'd also even consider um, with using it on staff as well. Um, but I would, that's the only two items I would be interested in using ARPA funds for. I feel that we need to give something back to our residents. I am not in support of increasing the master fee schedule unless it's for non-residents. Let's see. And I believe I have covered everything, um, Mayor Willison. I, I have some additional comments. Oh, there was one um, actually that I talked to the city manager about. And that is if you've noticed that we do have a significant graffiti around the city on our utility boxes. Um, there's a possibility for a pilot um, to do an art project with that. I would definitely be supportive of that because it's a citywide issue. And um, at this time, Mayor Willison, I don't have any other comments. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. May I ask a, a follow-up question to one of your um, excellent comments? Um, regarding ARPA, um, so looking at the current proposed budget that staff has presented to us, are you, I just want to clarify if you're comfortable with the use of the 3.7 million that they have built in, or when you said it should be used on residents and staff, um, does that mean that you are not interested in building it into the proposed budget, but having a separate thing? I just wanted to get that clarification. Correct. So it's the latter. Yes. Okay. I'm not in support of using it. So then um, the 3.7 million reduction for this year that would result. Just curious if you have any additional thoughts about that. So because this is our first discussion on it, and I know we probably will only have one more, um, just thinking about, I mean, we had a few residents call in to talk about tightening our belt. Um, we need to, I, I believe that's the direction we need to go in. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, let's see, we're moving on now um, to Council Member Combs. I believe you spoke next. Yeah, so um, can you help me, Mayor Willison, um, uh, direct my comments in a way that's going to be most useful? What is, I don't know where, where maybe we're looking for additional support on something, or is, is there, I can go down the I think it would be budget. helpful. Thank you. So this is your opportunity if there's anything else um, you want to say, but I would think it would be helpful to go through the budget strategies. First of all, if there's anything that's jumping out of your mind off the service level enhancements, I think you've already commented on most of those, but I think it would be helpful to hear um, the budget strategies um, from everyone. Um, yeah, so budget strategies, I'm supportive of, of uh, the the ARPA funds being used, there is a specific um, sort of uh, obviously deadline uh, by which they need to be used. And 
if we pull them out and don't use them, then I guess we're just using the three point seven from some reserve fund. Um, and then and then we have to find another use for the ARPA funds uh, by December 2024. So I, I just say uh, keep, keep the funds where where they are um, at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily in favor of of updating the master fee schedule um, uh, at the at this moment in time. Um, one thing. I'm trying to uh, service level reductions. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I, I know one of the things that stood out was this idea of, of reducing some of the median and other sort of parks and recreational facilities maintenance um, uh, uh, schedule. I, I think to the tune of twenty percent, uh, and that saves a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Actually wouldn't be supportive of, of that. Um, I always notice immediately when um, the medians have been cut um, and maintained. I, I think it, it immediately makes the city look better um, and I'm not necessarily in favor of, of reducing that schedule. I don't, I don't know exactly where, um, where that, that total stands among council members. Um, and, and uh, you know, re reiterate what I said. Uh, I know that, like, with I'm not necessarily in favor of or opposed to any of the revenue generating options. Although I approach all of them with a great deal of skepticism, as I said, given the moment and time we're we're at. Um, I I do know that like it becomes easy for us to say, let's increase the TOT because again. Those aren't, in most cases, residents of Nimmo Park. Of course, not all cases. And so it's easy for us as elected officials to, to raise the taxes on people who don't, <clears throat> don't vote for us. But I think for me, I look at it more broadly um, and like, is this a moment which we should raise taxes on anyone, right? And so whether they are resident of Nimmo Park or not, and so I always think it's like, to be honest, an easy way out to say I'm going to tax uh, to tax people who I know don't don't live in my city. We we don't have this issue, but larger cities who have airports like like to tax like you know the rental car fees, um, right? It becomes an easy way, but for me it becomes fundamental. Like, is this a moment which we should be increasing taxes? And if it is, then it could be the TOT or it could be UUT or it could be sales tax because we think that that's the right thing to do at the moment. Um, but if it's not, to me, they, these all fall in the same category. So I think those are, are, are my thoughts. I, um, let me know if there's anything specific that I, I should, um, uh, again, supportive of, of additional discussion on on the, the flock cameras uh, and, and whether um, that that's right. I there there was this uh, discussion about whether we should put that in the budget or not. To me, the issue is is that. I think that the community should have a discussion. And if we have it already budgeted, then I think that that um, seems to make the discussion one of which we, the discussion would have less merit than, than I think that it should if we already put uh, in the budget that, that we're gonna pay for it. So obviously my stance would be, let's not budget this at the moment. Let's have a, a substantive discussion uh, amongst ourselves. And most importantly, with, with um, the residents uh, in Menlo Park to see if this is a direction that they're supportive of. Um, and, if, and if it is, then, then, then that's fine, then let, let's receive, but, but I don't think we can, we can um, it would be appropriate to budget for that um, because that would essentially be making a decision um, and then and not having, like I say, a full-fledged sort of substantive discussion. Um, thank you for that robust um, feedback. So you weren't sure what you were gonna say and then you had, Really great feedback on everything. Um, so actually I have a follow-up question for you, Council Member Combs and Vice Mayor Taylor, since you've both gone then. So um, if we get to the point as we are seeing in our projected five-year forecast where we're um, you know, not bringing in the revenue to support our operations, it sounds like Vice Mayor Taylor, if you had to choose between um, cutting expenses, tightening the belt 
or looking to modify our reserve policy and being okay with fewer reserves. Um, my sense from Vice Mayor Taylor is you would want to tighten the belt, um, not necessarily dip further into lower our reserve policy. Um, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just I'm trying to help staff as they um, move forward with taking our feedback and actually producing the final budget and how to go. Yes. And then just as just to restate what I said earlier, when it comes to the library and community services, knowing what we were spending and what we're projecting to spend would be helpful. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. And Council Member Combs, same kind of follow up to you um, about the idea of um, looking at those neighboring cities who may have lower reserve levels. Are you comfortable looking at that or um, more interested in tightening the belt if needed? Um, I, I think for, for me, uh, both would be on uh, on the table, like right, understanding all of the the, the knock on effects of of changing the reserve levels uh, would would be would be important. Um, and and but but again, then that becomes understanding that that becomes like a one time hit. Like right, if if you could then get to reduce your reserve levels, then you you get to pull that money out and. And 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 that's that will resolve your problem at that moment in time, unless you're willing to continue to go and lower your reserve levels, <laughs> then it becomes like like a one time fix. What isn't in, in more enduring, of course, is is tightening the belt. Like when when you say that there is something that <clears throat> you're going to for the foreseeable future not do or do less of. And I know I just a few minutes ago said I didn't want to lessen any any sort of uh, um, maintenance of medians um, but that's something that has an enduring a uh, long-term impact uh, because of the cost that you have that you won't have in the future um, and until you decide to bring that cost back and and, and so that, that's why I would I was I, I would be a, open to a discussion about the reserves but understanding that that's just just a one-time one-time hit and, and that, that you know bolt tightening especially as we see war revenue, um, for you know the foreseeable future would need to be handled again um, in, in a way that that uh, you know projects out uh, certain certain cost savings and not just at a moment in time. Thank you. Excellent point. Um, I believe it was Councilmember Door that went next. So um, Councilmember or was it Councilmember Nash? Which one? Which? Okay. Uh, Councilmember Door, why don't you go? Sure. Um, I believe that ARPA should be used. Um, go ahead and use that 3.7 million. I, um, on reducing our uh, reserve, I'm wary of that, especially as we are a smaller community. And if there are concerns about what the future holds. It feels like holding on to that flexibility and holding on to that funding funding for the time being makes sense. Um, I'm not interested in doing service level reduction, especially on the parks, because this is the, the face of Menlo Park and where so many of our community members derive a lot of joy. And so I feel very strongly about keeping maintenance up to the current levels. Um, and on the revenue generating measures, the TOT is of greatest interest to me. And I um, appreciate some other comments that have been made about uh, thinking about the impacts that, that those taxes have. And I'm also thinking about um, our neighbor, Palo Alto, if they have a, I think, was it 15% and we have a 12% a or something. Um, that just seems like a big difference there. and. Um, we can, we don't have to go that the whole way there, but we could move in that direction and that might be useful. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, I am not on here that I would like us to talk about more is IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure act. Um, and I know that there might be some, some learning that must be done on the staff side, as well as on the, the council side. And so I'm wondering, uh, 
I'm not sure if a study session would make sense, but maybe a study session, a place to have conversation, talk about that resource, uh, maybe have a conversation with someone who knows more than, than we do share about that. And I think that's where I'd be um, especially excited to see opportunities. Thank you, Council Member Dorr um, and Council Member Nash. And then we're gonna be um, wrapping it up. Um, so I'll be trying to summarize. So if you have any last thought, um, get it ready to go. So um, ARPA, I am disappointed that we're not using it for our residents, but I think that it makes sense at this point to go ahead and um, use it as budgeted in the built into the pro proposed budget. Um, the flock cameras, I'm wondering what is the difference between going ahead and budgeting it now, or um, can we bring it in later if we make that decision? I definitely, if we have a study session, I, I don't want it just to be window dressing. We definitely have to have a robust discussion with the ability to go either way. Um, but my understanding had been that it would be difficult. Anyway, how do you view that? Staff can certainly budget it um, now, and, th and that would mean that those funds were earmarked for that specific purpose um, versus uh, bringing it back in a mid-year adjustment following a study session. Uh, we can accommodate either. In that case, I would um, agree that we should wait to budget it um, and go ahead with the study session first. Um, reserve policies. I was in um, I was in I, I wanted to look at the reserve policies, um, but I'm wondering if we should wait another year and see how this year and what the economic environment looks like before actually doing the research on it, especially since it sounds like other um, colleagues are not interested in that, but I am um, I guess I would be open to looking at the reserve policies, um, but more interested in doing it after we get through this year or have a better idea of what the future holds. Um, I agree about the, we should not be reducing weeding and park maintenance right now, especially given that we are um, looking at that in the next, one of the um, administrative citations. Um, I certainly think that we have to um, provide a, example of what we are looking for um, and we should not reduce that. Um, when we're talking about um, a high level of service, I want to make a distinction between service for our residents and our taxpayers versus um, the many people in surrounding communities who we also welcome to all our programs, um, but who um, when belt tight, when we have to tighten our belt, um, perhaps we should look a little bit more carefully at who exactly is using our programs. I'm specifically thinking of some of the library classes um, that we were talking about and um, really prioritize things that residents are using. Um, and um, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Nash. I believe Vice Mayor Taylor, you had a question. Yes, thank you. And, and this is regarding the, this is attachment F, page H1.15 um, under Library and Community Services. There are three funds there, miscellaneous trust, donation, and then Marie Hoffman donations. So just wanted to find out, are, are any of these, are they, is it ongoing donations? Is it a one-time? We'll have Sean Reinhardt come address that. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for the question. I don't have the attachment in front of me, but I can remember it. Um, so primarily one-time funds that will be transferred to support the Menlo Park Community Campus. For example, the Maria S. Hoffman donation was a one-time uh, bequest from an estate toward the Senior Center Program, and those funds will be used toward the furnishings and equipment in the Senior Center and the new facility. We believe similarly, donations, library and community services uh, primarily entails one-time donations. 
uh, from the Friends of Menlo Park Library and the Menlo Park Library Foundation toward the furnishings and equipment in the Menlo Park Community Campus. So those also uh, one-time donations. However, um, there's also under, I believe it's under miscellaneous trust, the Friends of Menlo Park Library. They do fundraising on an ongoing basis every year on the order of about $145,000. So it's pretty much an ongoing evergreen donation that they do each year. And that primarily supports the many library programs that have been noted a few times tonight. Thank you for the information, Mr. Reinhardt. And just for, for clarity, it's, so you wouldn't know that unless you ask the question. And so I'm not sure if the there needs to be a separate income category for specifically legacy funds. So the one-time donation of fund 204 would go into that. Um, it sounds like I don't know who already identified that all three funds were going to go to, or two funds were going to go to the Menlo Park Community Campus, because I don't remember giving direction on Fund 204. So that's the, the Marie Hoffman donation. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. I, I do believe that the City Council gave direction on that at a previous session related to the Menlo Park Community Campus uh, project budget. I uh, can't call the date uh, to mind immediately, but we can certainly get that information back to the City Council with reference to that staff report and the Council action it was within the, the past um, several months, though. For this item, because I honestly don't remember it. This, the fund here, I knew about totally the understand. library and community service fund, but this one specifically, and it's my understanding that the city, this money was donated almost four years ago. Uh, uh, correct, and that was outlined in the staff report um, that went to the city council at the time the city council approved uh, that portion of the project budget. But again, we'll, we'll call that up okay. and, and distribute that to the city council. I'd appreciate it. So, which is why I asked the question about having a, a separate income category for legacy funds. So it's specific as to where the money is, is coming from and then what it's going to be used for. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, okay, so um, I know we've been going at this for a little over an hour here. Um, so trying to wrap us up. Um, can you please um, go back to the two slides and I'm gonna do my best to summarize and then maybe um, Ms. Ms. Mello and Mr. Stolte, if you can tell me if you think there's anything that we are off on. Um, so, okay, going back to the strategy, so I think uh, there's consensus to go with the staff recommendation on using the ARPA money. I do want to say I, I do think it is for our residents. It might not be for you know a added thing above and beyond, but this all is for our, our residents. I do think so. But your point is well taken. Um, in terms of um, the master fee schedule, I was hearing some um, mixed reviews on the updating it. But are you? Okay, so um, I, you're planning on doing it unless you, please, Ms. Mello. Yes, so we are planning on um, bringing that back for future consideration. We could certainly look at um, tiering options, uh, different rates for residents versus non-rates is what I'm hearing from um, multiple council members okay. might be worth exploring. So Great. We, we'd do more, we would do more research and bring that back. Thank you very much, Ms. Mello. Um, service level reductions, I'm hearing a um, little bit of mixed reviews here. So I'm hearing don't touch with the landscaping. So, um, but I am hearing some belt tightening desire. So I'm not quite sure how to square that. Um, so I guess uh, I'm going to leave it up to you staff to interpret or if you have any thoughts about how you would interpret that feedback, Mr. Solte. <clears throat> Yes, it is mixed feedback on that one. Um, what I will say that um, we could explore future reductions at a later time. It is dependent on contract terms. So some of these things aren't very immediate. Um, okay, so um, I would say as opportunities present themselves um, to bring them forward. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure, like I said, how to, to grapple with that, but maybe we can 
you have two weeks to figure it out. Thank you. Um, uh, potential revenue generating measures. So um, completely understand um, what uh, Councilmember Combs and folks are saying about you know the timing of all this and hitting somebody. And we obviously um, we rely on our hotels and we really want them to be successful. So we need to be very sensitive about going forward. But I do think that that is one of the ones that's rising to the top. Um, and then I really think this is about our community figuring out how much we want and what we're willing to pay for and what we're willing to give up. So, um, which I guess is what a potential ballot measure would be about at the end of the day. That That's what the question would be before voters and before residents. So um, I, I think it's not a bad conversation to have in a community. Um, so there's that. Um, and then reserve policies. Um, Again, I think we're kind of in a wait and see on that. Um, so, um, and then I, I think that the consensus here um, about the flock cameras is to go ahead and um, wait for potential mid-year budget amendment um, after a study session. I think that is what the council is feeling more comfortable with. So we we know that um, our chief and Commander Moffitt have been working um, to, to bring this forward. And we appreciate your patience as we do our due diligence um, for our community on this. Um, and uh, I'm now gonna ask um, our staff if there's anything that is unclear or missed or um, that you want more feedback on. So there were two remaining um items here. And the first is a little more pressing and it's the unfunded accrued liability additional payment. And I heard from, I think it was only you, Mayor, that you were had some hesitancy there with previously established council policies. Um, that is all, already included in the proposed budget as a suspension for the next fiscal year. Um, one way to look at it is just to kind of save on cash right now. And we could revisit that at a later time too. Um, but it would be suspending a, a approximately $1 million payment um, in this fiscal year budget. It is something we could come back to, but I, I didn't quite hear um, other feedback on that one. And because it's baked into the budget right now, I, I would pass that back to council. Uh I mean, I don't know what choice, I mean, the alternative, let's walk through the alternatives for a moment, would be either to cut that amount from somewhere else um, or to lower our reserves even further at this time. Um, does anyone have a preference on that? And just to note, it's a two-year suspension, and then it comes back at half a million dollars in the last three years of the forecast, at least for now. Councilmember Nash. I mean, I would just say if it, um, life looks better than what we are projecting, that should be one of the top items that comes back in front of us, just so we don't forget about it. I think it is very important. And I'll, I'll mention that the Strategic Pension Reserve, that's where those monies um, come from that is still set aside as a separate reserve bucket. So those funds would be there whenever the council seeks to reestablish those additional payments. So I, I think moving forward with staff's recommendation at this time um, would be prudent. I, I don't see anyone objecting to that. So thank you. And then the final thing is um, the one-time developer payments and the amenities funds. I think um, it was the general uh, feedback I heard was more information on, on that and on that spending. So we can come back to council with that. I think that would be that would be great. Thank you. Um, so with that, do you have what you need for the to, to do a bunch of work before June 27? <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for framing this conversation in a way that this is extremely complex and the fact that we were able to tackle it, I think in a little over an hour, um, and get to some real core policy questions, um, is a testament to the work that staff that you all put into preparing for this. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, we are going to move on, um, we are going to move on to 
I, regular business. Under regular business, the city council considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters or administrative actions that require city council approval. The first regular business item is I-1, adopt a resolution renewing chapter 2.70 of the municipal of the Menlo Park Municipal Code entitled Military Equipment Use Ordinance, Menlo Park Military Equipment Use Policy, and finding that the 2022 Menlo Park Police Department Annual Military Equipment Report complies with the standards of approval set forth in Menlo Park Policy Department Policy 708.7 and Government Code 707D. That just rolls off the tongue. And to introduce that item is Police Commander TJ Moffitt. Good evening again, Council. Um, go to the, the next slide here. So as you may recall, in 2021, the California State, uh, excuse me, California Assembly Bill 481 was signed into law. And pursuant to that, subsequently in 2022, the City Council adopted Ordinance 1089 adding a new section to chapter 2.70 of our municipal code, uh, which approved a military equipment use policy for police services and requires that we do an inventory of uh, any uh, aforementioned items. Uh, AB 41 also requires us to do an annual review. This is something that's happening with law enforcement agencies across the state right now. Um, and that uh, includes the completion of an annual military report, which is included for you uh, with the staff report attachments. AB 41 was codified in California Government Code Section 7070 at Sequitur and provides a list of uh, equipment types that are to be considered military equipment for uh, purposes of compliance with AB 41 and the related government code. Uh, what I do want to point out is that while we do have some items that are codified within AB 41, uh, the Mendel Park Police Department does not own any equipment that was obtained from the military. Um, the uh, types of equipment that we do have are also again listed in the report under attachment D. Um, and we also wanna call attention to the fact that while we do not as a city or police department own additional items, we do participate in a regional uh, special weapons and tactics or SWAT team, and that team does possess items um, that are owned through other municipalities and departments, but trying to be as transparent as possible, we want to let you know about that nexus, and that's included as attachment E. Uh, I think the, the, the most important part, part is have we used any of this equipment as listed in Government Code 7070 in the past year? Uh, and the, the response to that is no, we have not um, used any of that equipment um, or uh, added to it. Um, what we're looking for at this point, our recommendation is to, uh, as you stated, adopt a resolution to um, accept the annual military report, approve it, and renew our ordinance and policy. Uh, we're not requesting any additional equipment um, that falls under this category for the following uh, calendar or fiscal year. Um, with the only understanding that the munitions that these uh, items use can be depleted if there's a significant event. And we may be looking at that point to uh, replenish our stock, but not enhance it. And with that, uh, I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you, um, Commander Moffitt. Um, so are there any clarifying questions or if not, we can go directly to public comments. Um, so City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our first regular business item, I-1, adopt a resolution renewing a chapter in the Menlo Park Municipal Code entitled Military Equip Use Equipment Use Ordinance. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item I-1. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. Um, is there any council discussion on this item. Uh, Council Member Nash. 
Thank you. I have a question about um, the 40 millimeter launchers, which you probably are aware East Palo Alto um, made it into the newspaper because they have decided to um, move them out of circulation into secure storage pending um, a resolution for disposal. And I'm wondering what your thoughts, I mean, we are not doing that. Yeah, thank you for your question. No, we are not currently doing that. Um, I'm going to defer to, to Chief Norris here in a moment, but what I can say is that when compared with other alternative options, um, first, you know, highlighting that it was not used in the past year, but um, with considering alternative, less lethal uh, force options, the specific munitions that we use with the 40 millimeter launcher, the benefit of them is they have a higher level of accuracy compared to alternatives. And with many of these types of devices, there's a minimum standoff distance. So if a person gets too close, there's a higher elevated risk of serious injury or death. The munitions that we utilize with our 40 millimeter launchers have a zero offset, meaning even at an extreme close range, in some instance, if it was ne necessitated that we needed to use that tool, it is a much lower risk to uh, the person involved than alternatives. And that's why uh, many agencies are using uh, that type of uh, a delivery system. But with that, I'll, I'll turn over to Chief Norris. Just very, very briefly, because I think I think Commander Moffat just covered this answer adequately. Um, we we are you know currently util continuing to utilize the same equipment that we were using. Um, I did have a conversation with East Palo Alto's chief this afternoon just to uh, be certain of the reasons why they they are making the changes that they are, and and so their changes have to do with the uh, age of the equipment. The, uh, the specificity with which they use other alternatives and the fact that their officers are more comfortable with using some of those other, which are also non-lethal alternatives. And so uh, every agency has its own style and its own priorities as to how they want to accomplish a situation safely while preserving the sanctity of life and, and doing the best we can to resolve a situation without having to re resort to any type of deadly force action. And so, uh, you know, how, what, what we choose as our option is based on our officers' comfort and training and what East Palo Alto chooses is based on, you know, their comfort and their training as well as our existing equipment capabilities. Thank you, that's very helpful. Are there any additional questions or comments around the military equipment item? Is there a motion that someone would like to make? And what what are we moving? <laughs> what do you need from us? Uh, so um, attachment A is the adoption of the resolution uh, that is um, approving the military use report and renewing the uh, associated policy and ordinance. Thank you, Commander Moffat. I'm I'm happy to move that myself. I'm happy to second. Thank you, Councilmember Nash. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to adopt a resolution renewing Chapter 2.70 of the Menlo Park Municipal Code entitled Military Equipment Use Ordinance. Menlo Park Military Equipment Use Policy. The finding that the 2022 Menlo Park Police Department Annual Military Equipment Report complies with the standards of approval set forth in Menlo Park Police Department Policy 708.7 .7 and Government Code Section 7071D. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by a roll call vote, City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. Mayor Wollison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to I-2, which is waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Chapter 1.15, Administrative Citations, and amending Chapter 8.04, Nuisances, to add additionally enumerated nuisances to Section 
0.04.010. And to introduce this item is Police Chief Dave Norris. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Council. And uh, I, I have only one slide for you. I don't have really a presentation. This is really just what our recommended action is on this ordinance. Just a very, very brief history uh, for uh, a long period of time, at least during my tenure here, um, it has become my understanding that while we continue to take a community policing approach to all of our code enforcement activities and try to find some type of voluntary compliance, there is a point at which for some members of our public that 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 attempt to get some type of voluntary compliance comes to an end and the part where it is or else, like what happens after that, uh, we have very little tools in, in, in terms of what we currently have to deal with or address that. And so what this administrative citation ordinance does is it provides us with some extra tools on the rare contingency where we cannot get voluntary compliance uh, that allows us to provide some actual you know, action to our, uh, our admonishment on this of, we need you to make these changes for the betterment of the community. And if not, there may be consequences. So now we are able to add some consequences uh, to this. So uh, what we are asking for is to add a chapter uh, that, uh, that calls for administrative citations and to uh, add to some of the enumerated nuisances so that there's clarity within that code. Um, the additions to those nuisances are the accumulation of vegetation and similar matter visible from streets, accumulation of junk, trash, or debris, uh, dilapidated and failing fences in any condition which is declared to be a public nuisance by municipal code um, and any violation of the zoning ordinance. So uh, to be very clear on this, and I know that we've had some requests and, and for additional information or questions that have come from the public uh, as they're going through this ordinance, which you know obviously is also involved with some of the other items that we're gonna hear tonight, uh, there are avenues and there are remedies here if uh, we get to that point of citation, which might have a, a monetary fine attached to it, that if that individual is unable to pay for, for those fines or if there's some type of hardship, we have avenues for that. Um, the, the primary directive for us is to take a community policing approach and try and get to a solution without ever getting to this point of administrative citation. Uh, should we get past that point? and that person is unable to uh, pay through some type of a fine, we have some mitigation methods for that and that's folded into the code. And so I wanna just be very clear, like none of this is designed to hit anyone any harder um, than, than we have to in order to get the type of compliance that we need for the betterment of our community. And, uh, and with, with that, uh, that's why I added that extra comment here on the slide that you see, um, nothing changes our approach which is a community policing approach to try and get some type of resolution through a conversation, through some interaction, through some suggestion, or maybe even an offer of help to try and get the compliance that we need. This just provides us with tools if we can't accomplish it through those means. Thank you, Chief Norris for that. Um, so I think we'll just jump straight to public comment on this item. Um, City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item I-2, waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding chapter 1.15, administrative citations and amending chapter 8.04, nuisances to add additional enumerated nuisances to subsection 8.04.010. Please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press Star nine, if participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. And this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item I-2. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. And um, I'll actually start off on this one. Um, I received comments from residents, one saying the fines should be higher, and then another one saying they, you know, we shouldn't have fines to, to penalize people. So I think it's a complex 
topic. It's my understanding, and can you clarify that this is kind of a required step for our next item um, to have a, a kind of an enforcement capability with a potential um, Zelly ordinance? So I'll, I'll answer that first by saying this is a required step overall within the field of code enforcement and gaining compliance for you know anything that is uh, that is out of compliance with with our codes and regulations uh, we currently do not have a tool that adequately addresses that in a comprehensive way and so overall this is an important step and then yes to to your your specific question um, as we look at the, the 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 first question anytime we introduce, uh, something that will be a requirement or a new condition for our community to follow. Um, we have to ask the question of what does enforcement look like? And so this helps us to more completely answer that question with the first part being what I described, which is like, we're going to take a community policing approach to this. We're going to take a, a community collaboration approach to this and try to get compliance in any other way that we can. But if we can't do that, we need to have a tool. And so, yes, in order for us to accomplish what we want to accomplish through that that zeal ordinance, uh, we need to have a tool that will help us address that. Thank you. And then um, looking at the um, added nuisances, particularly around grass levels. So um, within walking distance of my home, there's one parcel that I would say is the perfect candidate for an administrative citation and that probably should be fined and um, they're kind of egregious. Um, it's a commercial property. And also near my home, there's several BMR units where people have kind of brown grass um, that I don't, I mean, it's it can be a lifestyle choice too, especially with us all living through many droughts. I know this exempts kind of drought years, but um, I'm worried there's a four inch grass level. Um, I think, how will we make sure we're not penalize we're, we're penalizing kind of bad actors but not folks who are just maybe not into cookie cutter green grass situations so just just so we just just as we're concerned with the idea of over policing when you're talking about you know whatever it is vehicle code or criminal codes or whatever it is um we want we, we what we want is peace and order in our community right and so we will always be taking that first step of, of taking a low key approach, trying to find some type of conversation that will help us to get there. Um, there we won't be running around with rulers, um, sticking them in the grass saying, okay, you're over four inches. So now we're gonna write you a ticket. It's gonna be knocking on the door saying, hey, we've noticed this, or this has come to our attention through a complaint from the community. Um, you, need to, you need to cut your lawn. And you know we're going to give you some reasonable time to accomplish that. And so, uh, so the approach is still going to be a community policing approach. But this does give us the ability to to backstop that with if that person is not available or these these are you know people who are property absentee property owners who are not paying attention. It does give us additional tools to help us get that compliance. I hope that answers your question. It does in a way, but I think I guess if it, there's a lot of discretion involved, but um, I, I think I'm still slightly worried about um, that, but I want to hear from my colleagues because um, I, I know it, it's kind of one of those, I know it when I see it, it's a problem. Um, but if someone just kind of hasn't been cutting their grass, but they have some dispute with their neighbor who's looking to penalize them, um, I'm just wondering, would, would the police push back to the neighbor and say, it's not that big of a deal. Like, maybe I'll I'll add to the answer then, and I'll and I'll say, it it's very hard when you have when you have two people that have different opinions to tell either one of them, and it's not that big of a deal, um, because that that will start an argument that you will never win. Um, but what I but what I can tell you is that um, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it has to be an immediate or else. And we this this is this is not. This ordinance is not an immediate or else. We are not sending our officers or our community service officers or our code enforcement personnel out with a with a ticket book. Now we have this ordinance and we're going to go, you know, and and make everybody comply. But what it does do is it is it allows us when when we're responding to complaints to have 
kind of the the last act available to us where it currently is is not really available in in a substantive way. Thank you. I've been hogging the time. So um, I'll turn over to my colleagues if anyone has questions or comments. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison, and thank you, Chief Norris. Um, being familiar with at least a couple of the complaints um, that have happened in the city, can you just pick one, um, and you don't have to say where it is, and just how would this new um, code apply to an existing problem? Sure. So we, we actually have many examples throughout the city, and I wouldn't want to pick on any, any one location in particular or, or, you know, shine a spotlight on any individual in, in this forum. But I will say that um, we've had a number of instances where we've had to go to tremendous lengths to uh, attempt to gain compliance and hit a dead end where we have asked and asked and asked, and we do not have a remedy to take it to the next step and gain the compliance. And um, often we will we will pivot and we will go back to some type of conflict resolution strategy or uh, look for a remedy like we have in patrol. If, for example, someone gets stopped for you know a cracked windshield. Um, and we and we say you need to get your windshield fixed, and they tell us, hey, we can't afford to get our windshield fixed. We find a way to make that work because the pri the priority is the safety, right? And so uh, finding ways, and and I'm sure that you know through through the ex extensive length of time that we have to come up with the appropriate enforcement strategy, for example, with this zeal ordinance, um, to find ways that we can help to. Uh, bridge the gap where there where there might be a need to comply with certain ordinances. We're going to look for ways that we can do that, and it may not be, um, you know, if that person's unable to do it, then maybe we can find someone that can help them get the rest of the way. Maybe that neighbor needs to come and help that person cut their yard, as an example. Um, but we we would be looking for ways to make this a collaborative approach, regardless of whether we have this uh, tool in our toolbox. Thank you. And I just have two more questions. Um, because Menlo Park is a mixture of both renters and homeowners, um, how are you, will you address a renter that has a property owner that will not make the repairs? That, that's where this tool is very helpful because it allows us to add some consequences where currently um, it's a lot more difficult to add some consequences and we can go directly to property owners um, in, in situations like that. And uh, now, now we have a tool that, that is kind of the backstop to say, this is what needs to happen, or you, you may be facing additional penalties. And prior to this, it was much more difficult for us to do that, to say, or this will happen next. This will give us that, that ability. And my, my last question, Chief, is and this may have been addressed in the staff report, but just how how is outreach going to be done um, about the about the ordinance as opposed to just automatically the ordinance is in effect and then you're you're um, implementing it? I, we we would engage in a in a similar uh, strategy of education, a, the, the lengthy strategy of education prior to engaging in enforcement. Uh, for all but the cases where um, there is already some type of a you know known reluctance to comply that's already well established, um, and that would involve uh, doing something similar to what our team is doing now, which is providing some proactive information to our community members on some of the most common code enforcement concerns and issues uh, through a door hanger program. So what it will actually hang a brochure on doorknobs to say. Uh, just so that you're aware, these are some of the most common ways that that uh, people can fall out of compliance with certain codes. I want you to be aware of it. We're available to answer any questions. Um, we've also discussed doing a similar program through the website so that that information is available both in electronic means. And, you know, we know that some of our residents are, are not as good with, with email and website access as they are with in-person communication. So it, it will be a multimodal approach to providing that education. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? 
Uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you. I'm pleased to see this coming forward. My question is about, um, well, I'll just name it hedges, which is something which um, some neighbors, anyway, how do you, how are you going to deal with um, situations where it needs to be, um, you don't want to single out one neighbor, although that's where the complaint may be, and across the street, the same situation may be going on. And how do you deal with that if one neighbor is getting um, sure. cited for um, something and it's prevalent elsewhere? So two two thoughts to that. First first of all, often we, we need to primarily take each each of these complaints or concerns as as individual situations but to your point often this becomes well you know yeah i know i'm out of compliance but joe down the street is also out of compliance and why aren't you doing anything about that and so that's where um once once we kind of get a a trigger to that um through conversation which you know again this is community policing approach first right conversations with folks who who may be out of compliance with certain ordinances uh, once we get an inkling that this may be a well, yeah, it's me, but like I'm only doing it because the guy across the street. Well, that that should be a signal to us that there needs to be a, a broader education campaign, and maybe and maybe we pull back and we and we go to an educational campaign first, uh, educate the entire neighborhood, make sure that everyone knows kind of like how much time that we're providing for them to, you know, correct these issues, and and if they're not corrected, we have to be, um, you know fairly even handed with the with the entire neighborhood. And so if there are multiple issues in the neighborhood, we we would have to come back and conduct enforcement. But primarily what we want is compliance with the with the codes. Thank you. And, I'll, and I'll say that as not not an expert on hedges at all. Okay. Well okay. I mean very honestly, I think our um, municipal code on hedges is stricter than it might need to be. So I'm but I will leave that to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Council member, we, um, I apologize if I'm seeming a little abrupt. We are trying to get through um, this item and then our next item before some of our council members um, turn into pumpkins um, wherever they are. So um, council member door, please. Just want to affirm and have it um, audibly affirmed by the chief that rewilding efforts, if someone is trying to do something different um, and do native growth and rewilding in some way that maybe is a little bit more um, exuberant than a typical lawn, that that would still be allowed for someone to do. That That's a little beyond my expertise, if, if I'm being very honest about that. But, you know, we're, we're open to having conversations with people and, and we want to listen first. And I, I, I would hope that by now, you know, two years plus in, that my entire organization knows that listening first is crucially important. Um, and so I can commit to you that we will listen and, and that if there's a way to, you know, find some type of agreement or some, or some type of solution that may not be conventional, um, but will satisfy all parties that we will, we will look towards that. All right. Um, Council member Combs, do you have anything to add or would anyone like to make a motion on this item? Oh, Council Member Door. I'm happy to make the motion. Okay. And Council Member Nash? I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Door. A second by City Council Member Nash to waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Chapter 1.15 administrative citations. Any further City Council questions or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Combs? Yes. City Council Member Doer? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we are now moving on to our next regular business item, which I cannot find. Okay, we're moving on to I-3 which is waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment, ZELI. 
to introduce this item is our sustainable man sustainability manager, Rebecca Lucky. And um, I would encourage Ms. Lucky to be brief with her presentation if possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Wilson. Yes, hear that loud and clear. Good evening, council members. I'm Rebecca Lucky, your sustainability manager for the city. And <clears throat> so tonight we're going to go over the proposed rules for gas powered gardening equipment. And there's been a ton of research on this topic, um, not just with gas powered leaf blowers, but all types of gas powered handheld equipment, push lawnmowers. And they all come to the same conclusion that they emit um, toxic and carcinogenic um, substances and fine particulate matter that contribute to respiratory and chronic respiratory diseases. And the California Air Resources Board recently adopted a uh, law that would require manufacturers beginning in 2024 to um, make electric gardening equipment. So the proposed rules for you to consider tonight is it, it would, if you move forward with it, it would start on July 1st, 2024 with two pieces of gas powered equipment being prohibited in the community. That would be leaf blowers and string trimmers. The alternative would either be battery powered, there's corded electric equipment, um, there's also manual equipment as well. And then the next phase would be January 1st, 2029 for walk behind mower, lawn mowers, hedge trimmers, and chainsaws. The hours of operation would remain the same as they currently are for electric powered equipment and any violations would be tied to the property owner. So it would not, the, the professional gardeners would not receive the violation. And that's really in, in hope and, and with outreach that property owners do work with their hired gardening professionals to transition and give enough lead time to, to make that transition. I'll just mention that we did provide a webinar, both in English and Spanish, on uh, a landscaper that did transition, Armando Vega. He is second generation um, owner of EnviroViews. They have transitioned 80% of their equipment over two years. Uh, they found that they were able to save on cost. They had, they've got their return on investment in two years. It did require retraining and increasing some of their customer costs. We did outreach with, with gardeners um, and most, I, I would say for the community and professional gardeners, there was a majority of support for regulating leaf blowers and uh, gas powered leaf blowers and string trimmers starting July, 2024. For the other equipment, the, um, gardeners were not supportive of that. The hedge trimmers, lawn mowers um, and chainsaws and the community itself too was very split on that front. There is a state discount program for electric equipment. It offers, they offer 70% discounted equipment at select stores and very little information is needed to access the discounted equipment. You need a business card, business license, you need to maybe purchase before at the store. It all provides access to professional gardeners, but not for residents. And so the incentive program started off November of 2022 at around 24 million. As of this month, there's 10 million left. So it's expected that the funds are going to be likely depleted by the end of the year. So part of the community outreach results indicated that residents felt like it could be a financial hardship for them to transition their own equipment and were requesting a potential local incentive program. Other cities have done that, Portola Valley, uh, Redwood City, Sam, City of San Mateo have done that as well and, and they're outlined in the report, but essentially for Menlo Park residents, they could get up to $250 per address per year as proposed and can be considered by a council. And then for, for commercial gardeners, once the discounted program expires or the funds are depleted, there would be an additional incentive for up to $1,000 for professional gardeners working in Menlo Park. So the next steps really at this point is if the council decides to uh, add the ordinance that would prohibit five types of gas powered gardening equipment, uh, we would come back on June 27th for formal adoption of the ordinance. And if desired, we could also come back with the rebate program for approval as well. And if that all goes through by the end of the month, 
then we would start to work just to inform gardeners and property owners about the proposed rules. We've got a lot of material already that we've done through the past research. We would just need to kind of change a few of the context and use the communication tools that we've been using that have been pretty effective, I'd say. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucky, for your speedy yet thorough presentation. Um, so with that, I think we'll jump straight to public comment. Um, I do, given the um, timing constraints we have, I'm going to be limiting any public comment that we have to um, a minute 30. Um, so um, please uh, uh, go ahead and City Clerk Karen, can you please call for public comment? Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on regular business item I-3 regarding waiving the first reading and introduction of an ordinance for zero emissions landscaping equipment, participating virtually, please engage that hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. Participating in person, please complete a speaker card and return it to me at the clerk's desk. All right, and our first speaker will be Leah Elkins, followed by James Pistorino. Hello, I think I can keep this quick under a minute and a half. Um, I, I, as the clerk said, said I, my name is Leah Elkins and I am a 25 year resident of Menlo Park. And I just wanna thank you for putting this up on the agenda. And thank you to the staff and uh, sustainability manager for her great and comprehensive report. I'm sure you've all read the report and you know the reasons why we're considering this zero emissions landscape equipment. So I uh, ordinance, so I won't really go into the details, but um, I just wanna say how happy I am that we finally reached this point. And um, I, along with several other Menlo Park citizens, started this campaign to ban the use of gas-powered leaf blowers about four years ago because of the, at first, the extreme obnoxious and relentless noise that these machines inflict on our neighborhoods. But once I began to study the impacts of leaf blowers, it became clear that they aren't just harmful to public health. I mean, they, aren't, they are just as harmful to public health as well as op including operator health as they are annoying. It is not just the emissions from the gasoline engine that are harming us. Um, it is also the constant disturbance of the soil causing particulate matter to be thrown into the air. This particulate matter uh, then of course goes into our lungs causing uh, many different uh, ailments that have been um, already uh, discussed in the, in the um, staff's report. Um, these are, I just wanna mention, these are the same fine particulate matters that we have seen during wildfires in our own area and which, and dramatically recently, um, Canadian wildfires turning New York skies orange. Um, there's no doubt whatsoever that these machines are harming our health, including the health of our children and including our nervous systems. Um, so I just want to say thank you much, thank you. very much. I, I am very grateful for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. Next up is James Pistorito, followed by Nancy LaRocca Headley. At this point, you probably wish I had stayed home. Um, I just wanted to quickly, in my minute and 30, go over a few things super quick. First off, it seems like the council is totally schizophrenic, right? In the first part, we had the discussion about how the council had so much money that its investment strategy is guided by environmental conditions. In the second part of the discussion, the council, seems like the majority, really wants to raise the taxes uh, of the transit occupancy tax because they don't have enough money. The proposal, at least I understand on this one here, is here's another way the council can spend 200 grand, I thought was the first thing. Then the second thing that I think you just heard was a rebate program where it would be $250 per household. I don't, didn't hear in the presentation that what's proposed, um, their study contends that fully one third of the 12,000 households in Menlo Park do their own yards. That means 4,000 homes is what you're talking about. So if you know of a place where I could buy a lawnmower, a uh, string trimmer, a chainsaw, and a, and a hedge trimmer for $250, let me know. Everybody would like, that'd be a great deal. That doesn't exist. 
So the proposal is, here's another way the city, city could spend another million dollars. So just financially, it's off. And now, again, I'm not talking about the uh, leaf blowers. Well, there seems to me like there's a reasonable base of disagreeing, not on environmental grounds, but on noise. I was a little bit surprised to hear the contention about health because I thought at the last EQC meeting, the EQC itself described the, the uh, effects as negligible. I think it was the word they used. Um, the next thing I got real quick on my list was, again, in my short time, I just want to say, um, I do think um, the idea that the homeowner could be fined if his gardener, for example, battery died and used a gas-powered device, I don't think that's legal. I think that would be unconstitutional. So if anybody ever gets fined, for, I, I encourage the council to talk to your, your attorneys about that. If anybody ever gets fined for something like that, because something somebody else did, a gardener or whoever, contact me. I'll, I'll put my pro bono offer out there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Nancy LaRocca Headley, and this will be the final call for public comment on regular business item I-3. Thank you. I'm here tonight representing the Environmental Quality Commission. And I wanna acknowledge the hard work of researching and formulating these proposed rules by both uh, city staff and our former EQC commissioner, Leah Elkins. The commission discussed these proposed rules at our April meeting, and we advised city council to adopt the proposed rules and consider a local incentive program to help people purchase electric landscaping equipment. At the same time, we acknowledge that staff time is a precious resource, and we want to ensure that progress continues on the climate action plan, particularly for existing building electrification. We support moving forward with the Zelly recommendation provided the implementation is compatible with our ability to make progress on the climate action plan. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Amy Rolliter. Hi, can you hear me? No. Yes, go right ahead. Okay, can you still hear me? <laughs> yes. I, I just want to say, um, yeah, thank you for staying up so late to do all this. I can't believe how long these meetings go, but I just like to encourage you um, to adopt these rules um, for noise and pollution. I think so many of us in Menlo Park would be just thrilled if you did just for our peace of mind and just our health. Um, I just really hope that you do adopt these rules. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, seeing no further hands or cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Heron. So I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues for any questions or comments that they have on this ordinance. Uh, Council Member Dorr. I thank you. Um, so I know that there, uh, uh, Ms. Lucky shared about the availability of, of grant money from the from the state to, to cut the cost of seventy percent for a lot of equipment. Um, and not a, maybe a question, but a, a comment is uh, that seems like a really great, important resource and making sure it's really well publicized. I appreciated that there were some examples of, or one example of what was done uh, in previous outreach to let folks know about the potential of a ban. Um, and I would like to know um, it moving forward uh, that there will be efforts to make sure there's good outreach on that opportunity so folks can um, make it on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Combs, do you have any comments, sir? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I've struggled with this. Um, agenda item uh, this overall issue i i think we all want to end in the same place where there are less um or if in a case where there are no um gas powers uh, gardening uh, lawn equipment um uh, being used in um the community for both noise and pollution reasons i, I think the question is is, is how do we get there? And and for me, where I struggle 
is essentially using the city's police power, um, its enforcement power um, to say to uh, residents and others, people who work in the community, that you can't do something. And if, and if you do do it, that again, like I say, the, the city will, will, will um, use its police power, policing power in, in many respects to reprimand you in some way. And, and, and for me, that's where I have the problem, specifically because I know in this case, um, there will be disparate impacts uh, um, with regard to the, the, um, the, the, the enforcement of, of an ordinance, a measure like this, and in that um, it, it will be mostly people of color who, who will uh, be, be targeted, who will have you know, uh, uh, the police called on them. And again, while I do appreciate that the actual, um, you know, the, the actual infraction or, or the fine is is registered on the the property owner. Putting aside Mr. Pastorino's constitutional concerns, there, um, the people who will have the police called on them will disproportionately be people of color um, doing their jobs. And so for me, it's hard to um, wrap my brain around how this is not just criminalizing people of color doing their jobs. Um, and, and for me, that's where I'm, I'm stuck. Um, while I want to end in the same place, I, I'm not willing to accept um, this mechanism which I believe, like I said, has a disparate impact um, on uh, those who um, either live in our community or in our community doing work, um, who have in a lot of cases, the least amount of power. Um, so that, that's where I am. I, I won't be uh, supporting um, this, th th this ordinance for, for the, the, the concerns I've highlighted. Thank you, Council Member Combs. Uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, so I am a strong supporter of this ordinance. Um, I appreciate um, Council Member Combs's comments. I would, I am concerned about the health of the gardeners as well. And this will actually um, highlight that and hopefully move us in a good direction. Um, especially while there's state um, rebates and um, or incentives and also um, city incentives. I think that this is um, something that affects almost everybody. And especially in um, multifamily housing where you get multiple um, blowers at the same time and it's... Um, it, I think this will be very, very beneficial. I would actually, um, well, actually, and first of all, I want to acknowledge Shalia Elkins and um, Lisa Williams, who first met with me four years ago and have been pushing, and I don't think we would be here today without them. And also um, thank you to Ms. Lucky and the sustainability staff. Um, but I've your advocacy really made a difference. So thank you. Um, but I would actually be in favor of have, moving the date up to January 1st, 2024 to, I believe that we, people, many cities locally have already done this. Um, the incentives statewide st um, apparently stop January 1st. Um, so that would encourage people to um, complete their purchases um, of the, um, of the glass, of the electric leaf blowers. And um, I think that um, it would be beneficial to just get moving on this. Um, so I don't know if there's any other um, support for that, but I would um, say six months to um, move this forward would be plenty of time. We don't need to wait till July 1st. Um, I would leave the um, rest of it at the current, um, I would leave the, gas powered um, walk behind land mow lawn mowers, hedge trimmers and chainsaws at January 1st and um, leave it at that, but um, to move ahead. So thank you. 
Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And I, I, have, I have a couple questions and I will do my best to, to make this quick. Um, my concern is more around outreach. Um, the numbers that you that were provided in the staff report to me seem low um, because we do have a gardening service in Mental Park. And so I'm wondering why we didn't do outreach directly to them. And I'm speaking specifically about Kachina. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor, for that question. I have an interesting story about that. I was picking up some material for the storyboards for the Farmer's Market and Seleska Market Outreach, and where I picked it up was right next door to the landscaper you're referring to. So I did drop, I didn't get to speak to anybody individually, but I did drop off the flyer, the information about what the city is doing, um, invited, again, my, my name, my contact, everything was on there. I didn't hear back from them, but I can certainly reach out to them again. Is is it possible that that they're able to to take the survey, the same survey that was provided in the staff report, and it's not to add anything? I think it's important that when we have low numbers of outreach like that, I mean, to me, there should have been at least fifty, um, considering how many gardeners are in Menlo Park. Um, but just a way to be more inclusive. Um, I share um, Councilmember Combs' concerns about this disproportionately impacting folks. Um, who don't make $100,000 a year. And so I can't imagine thinking that you may lose your job because you don't have the right equipment and then your job won't provide it for you. So you have to save up to provide it for yourself. So it, to me, it adds a level of complexity to it, but just to have some compassion in what we do, it's good. We are, it's a good intention to not have gas leaf blowers, to have anything gas. However, I have to consider the folks who are, it's going to disproportionately impact, which is that that's their income. And it's not like it's a high income. So I'm trying to figure out ways to be more inclusive with the outreach to get more information because I actually did talk to the owner of Kachina and she shared with me the challenges that she's having because a lot of these grants that are being offered will not benefit her. So it's not, it's not an easy task. And so I feel like that we need to do um, just have a little bit more compassion about how we go about doing it. And then I appreciate moving the date up, but I'm, I'm more concerned about folks losing their job, losing their income, um, or potentially laying off employees just to be able to comply with this. So I'm trying to figure out how, how to make it all work. And I know it's not just up to me, thankfully, but, um, but I'm just letting you know the things that are coming to me in this conversation. Yeah. And, and if I may, it, it is a very difficult, and I, I think at our October 2022 study session, that is the main direction from city council was to do direct outreach. Um, and I think the online survey really proved how valuable the direct outreach was over the online or even just having a paper survey. There just wasn't a lot of interest in that, whether we texted it, whether we emailed you know, the link, um, but the one-on-one -on -one going out into the community, kind of talking to gardeners, and landscapers and hearing their feedback. And again, a lot of them didn't know about the incentive program, didn't really know how to access it. And I'd say like a lot of the folks who took the 311 respondents that took the community survey really did pass along the discounted information to their gardener, which is really good. And I followed up with a few of the stores afterwards and they were saying like, are you the girl that's on the bike? Because there's people showing up buying equipment at the discounted price. I mean, I can't say like how many, but you know, it was a very effective way at engaging with the gardening community. And it seemed to, to be what they took in the most was having that personal one-on-one -on -one conversation or discussion. And so a lot of the results that I shared in the PowerPoint presentation wasn't necessarily the online survey, but was more of the one-on-one -on -one contact with a very small gardener. It's not the larger one that um, you, you've spoken to but it can definitely follow up and, and try to find out why they're unable to access the incentives. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. Um, Council Member Dorr. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Lucky, for saying that last one about following up on incentives, because I think that's a big opportunity. Between the 70% rebate or incentive that the state is giving, along with the $35,000, 
that that kind of cap and amount of money that the city has set aside to support with this, it seems like a really big opportunity. And I was, um, I'm glad to see that the violations right now would fall on the landowners, um, as opposed to the small companies, uh, precisely uh, to address one of the things that Vice Mayor Taylor brought up of a concern that this will come as a repercussion, a negative repercussion to the small um, businesses and to workers who and gardeners who are out, uh, out um, in the mill park. And so um, I'm excited that that creates an incentive for landowners to talk, homeowners to talk to their gardeners more directly about this opportunity um, to help everyone win on air, on the quality of, of life, on improving, um, reducing money people have to pay on gas for these small companies, as well as getting those incentives. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Dorr. Um, excuse me, so um, it's my turn. Um, so I also wanna echo to Ms. Williams and Ms. Elkins. I also met with them four years ago. I wasn't even on council about this topic. Um, so it's tremendous what a couple of residents can do. Um, I think that this is one of the topics that I hear the most from my neighbors about, um, people that are not engaged in um, local politics or like, when are you gonna get rid of these things? Um, I hear my colleagues' um, concerns about unintended consequences. I think that the discussion we had with the chief about the administrative citation and the community of policing approach and really helping people. And I um, just want to um, remind or ask and follow up with the with the police and chief and the department that their way of dealing with folks in violation of codes um, will continue and that if it's a hardship for people um, to access um, these rebates and whatever, I have confidence that they're gonna, there's gonna be an adjustment period where they're gonna be working on education and, and helping people get there. Um, also, I think these rebates are an important component um, regarding the homeowner rebates for folks with gardening equipment. Um, I would be open to um, having that be kind of hardship based. Um, so I don't know if there's any kind of means testing using pg and &E CARES um, to have people qualify for um, that equipment rebate. Um, and uh, I do think that um, this topic's been in the news a lot lately. I think Atherton's moving in this direction. Burlingame um, is moving in this direction. So I think that um, most of the gardeners that work in Menlo Park likely work in other cities um, that are going to be facing um, these same types of ordinances. Um, so I'm very comfortable moving forward. I do think that um, all of the outreach material, I do think there's been a, quite a bit of outreach, has had the July 1st um, start date um, for the ordinance kind of printed and publicized. And so being able to piggyback on that outreach, I would probably be in favor of keeping that date to start um, so that we're consistent with the messaging that's already been done. I know we're, we're waiting for that quiet um, moment in our homes when we don't hear the blowers. Um, so those are my thoughts. I see um, Council Member Combs with your hand raised, so please. Yeah, I would just, and, and I know um, we're, we're trying to, and so not wanting to prolong um, where it's clear the council is going. I would just add that, like, you know, I too have had um, residents reach out to me and, and concerns about um, the, the noise, and I've uh, pushed back on that and have had some uncomfortable conversations, like, well, what about the people, like, right? um what what's the what are the impact on the people for you it's just a noise that that you hear and and that's that's something that is an inconvenience to you um but what about the person who that noise represents their livelihood um and so but my my main question is that i remember when we last discussed this there was some legitimate sort of questions about how enforcement would actually happen, like, and whether we were resourced to, to do it. I know that a neighboring community, which I will not name, has had a similar ordinance on the books for quite a while, um, but uh, you, you still saw, saw these uh, gas powered, uh, these small gas powered lawn and gardening equipments used um, because they did not have the resources to actually um, enforce, enforce it. And so that they actually 
more recently hired a dedicated code enforcement officer for this specific reason. And, and that's when it actually, you started to get some, some traction. So uh, is there um, plans to hire a, a dedicated code enforcement officer um, to, to actually enforce this? Um, and, and if so, like, how does that square with our, with our budget uh, constraints? Thank you, Council Member Combs. So the, we've got a bit of time before the enforcement date starts to look at all kinds of options for you know, education and enforcement. We actually surveyed other cities that have code enforcement, not necessarily um, with the city that you mentioned has a dedicated code enforcement, but other cities. And I think most of them, their lessons learned was doing the proactive, like be, before enforcement, outreach to really let everyone know about the rules, having that adequate time to transition. Um, but you know, as we move toward that July 2024 date for leaf blowers and string trimmers, it's you know kind of reviewing all of our options that are on the table and kind of seeing the uptake. And we have a lot of dedicated community volunteers, I've got to say, who helped with a lot of this outreach um, and, and kind of look at what's happening and kind of canvas and see if people have probably transitioned. Because I, I will say most of the gardeners that I encountered had an electric leaf blower in their vehicle or in their truck, um, but just weren't using it because we don't have any rules. But in other communities where they do have them, they are they are using them. Um, I will go ahead, um, unless there's any other burning questions, but I'm ready to make a motion unless anyone wants to join in. Uh, Council Member Nash. I just wanna say, um, I would not be in favor of hiring additional code enforcement. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor. If we're not hiring any additional code enforcers, enforcer, how is this gonna be done along with all of the other code enforcement issues, the existing issues? I don't know if that's a question for Chief Norris or our city manager, I'm not sure. Just I would just add one more kind of component to it. I mean, it's just keeping in mind that starting January 1st, you know, once people's equipment reaches the end of its life, they won't have an option to purchase any more gas equipment either. So there's kind of certain policies and other kind of programs that we're building upon. It doesn't solve all of the enforcement issue, but it's kind of looking again, how we can be more proactive and letting the community know and, and having that outreach component. And Chief Norris is here. I think if he wants to add anything, he certainly can. I think that's a, a key piece too, is that you won't be able to buy newer model gardening, gas powered gardening equipment starting January 1st, 2024. So we're gonna to have to transition regardless, probably starting January 1st, if their leaf blower you know, no longer works. Thank you for that information. So during the proactive period of doing outreach, there's still going to be enforcements that attach a fine. So the proactive period would start January to July of next year. So really, you know, sending out postcards to both gardeners and the community who hires gardeners about the proposed rules, letting them know about any incentives that are available to make the transition, guiding them to the gardener that I mentioned who has transitioned 80% of their equipment, how did they do that in English and Spanish? Um, and, and kind of, again, observing like within probably the first quarter, you know, have people started taking the steps to, to make that transition? Because again, we can easily kind of camp, I, I ride my bike into work. So there's at least one portion of a neighborhood that I can kind of see or ask and stop by and, and see if it's been working and checking in with some stores as well, because they do know where they work in which communities. And I just have another question with the outreach, the proactive activities that you're doing. So that requires staffing too, or are you doing that on your own? So because we've developed so much material already, I think we can easily adapt it without too much effort on what we currently have in our resources. 
So to develop, like we've already have pre-made postcards to send out. Again, it's just you know modifying the language a bit to say that we've actually adopted rules versus these are proposed rules. So, so the one request that I'll have, and and I will likely support it, is that there's some type of review, a quarterly review that goes to the EQC at, at minimum. Um, but I just would like to know how this is progressing, and then. If there are concerns, complaints that our gardeners have, um, that there is a way um, for them for that to be documented, so that we can improve upon it. I what I do not want to see happen is that we're creating something that is going to create not just create a hardship, um, but it it I don't want to create anything that's going to be a hardship on folks. And so I'm glad to hear that there's a grace period, so there will be at least 12 months where there are no fines. It's basically 12 months of outreach is what I hear um, in education. So the outreach doesn't start until January? Right. I mean, we okay. could start, of course we could start sooner, um, there, but I think the hitting the ground and really getting out the outreach uh, and because the state discount program, those funds are running out pretty quickly. We do want to audit, like once, the, if the city council moves forward this month, I mean, we're definitely going to let gardeners know um, that this is happening, you know, how to access those incentives, assist them if they're having trouble finding the stores or for some reason the stores are not accepting um, their request to get the discounted equipment. So providing that kind of touch service. Okay. Thank you. Is that anything else, Vice Mayor Taylor? I don't know. Chief Norris came up, so I figured I'd give him. <laughs> but briefly, Chief Norris. <laughs> I, I will be very brief and I, and I will be very direct on this. So uh, first of all, we have a lengthy period of time during which we're establishing an education campaign. And that is the most important component of this during which we can determine if we need to expand some of our code enforcement services. Um, I think we have time to assess that and make a determination. The second part of that is I have been very clear about this from the very beginning, and I will continue to be adamantly clear about this. I will not support the police department sending people out to proactively patrol the community for leaf blowers. I won't send those people out from the police department to proactively enforce on that. If we want to talk about, you know, putting personnel out on education campaigns and talking to people and having conversations, I am 100% in favor of that. I will not be doing proactive patrol to enforce leaf blowers. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think we've heard some direction probably um, in addition to the ordinance um, around outreach. Um, I. I'm wondering if there's support for the means testing of the homeowner rebate. I'm seeing a nod from council member Nash. Is there a, a third nod for that? Okay, I got a third nod. Okay, um, so um, I'm. is there any other feedback that anyone wants to give to staff or can we go ahead and make um, council member Nash? Okay. All right, so I'm going to make a motion to waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05 to require the use of zero emission landscaping equipment. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Willison and a second by City Council Member Nash to waive the first reading and introduce an ordinance adding Menlo Park Municipal Code Chapter 8.05 gasoline powered landscape equipment to require use of zero emission landscaping equipment by a certain date and repeal Chapter 8.07 leaf blowers and subsection C of Section 8.06.040 exceptions for gas powered leaf blowers. Any further city council question or discussion? Uh, yes, uh, city clerk Karen. Um, to, in addition, I want to pick up on Vice Mayor Taylor's request to have some reporting mechanism um, potentially to the EQC. I'll let we can let maybe staff figure out what the right timing is of that, but some type of check-in monitoring of how this is all going um, to have someone 
checking in on that. So we look forward to hearing staff's recommendation on what that looks like. Um, okay, I think that's it. Okay, so I will include that in this motion um, as stated to say, and to include a reporting mechanism with the EQC. And then uh, sustainability manager Rebecca Lucky has got uh, direction to return to city council what that will look like. Correct? Correct. And oh. just for my own point of clarification for the rebate program, you're looking at basing it on financial hardship or income. Correct, for the homeowner piece. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any further city council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Nash. Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor. No. City Council Member Combs. No. No. City Council Member Doer. Yes. Mayor Willison. Yes. And the motion passes three to two with City Council Members Combs and Vice Mayor Taylor dissenting. Thank you. Thank you very much, City Clerk Karen. Um, okay, we are at 1032 and we are moving on to our informational items. Informational items are transmitted to the City Council and staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the City Council. Informational items are not action items. However, a City Council member, City staff member, or a member of the public may request to make a comment or ask a question on any of the informational items. Do we have any public comment, City Clerk Karen, on informational items? Thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on our informational items, J1, City Council agenda topics, J2, transmittal of city attorney billing, or J3, the police department quarterly report out or quarterly update for quarter one. If participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in chambers, please complete a speaker card at that back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Final call for public comment on our informational items J1 through J3. Seeing no hands or cards, Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. We are moving on to our City Manager's report. Um, City Manager Justin Murphy, do you have any report outs? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Wilson. I can just update on the uh, the uh, Juneteenth event this Saturday at Carly Clark Park. It's scheduled uh, to run from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So that's a uh, Juneteenth event this Saturday, um, uh, June 17th. Thank you. And I'd earlier said 10 a.m. So if you show up at 10 a.m., um, enjoy your morning, but please come at 11 a.m. Okay. Um, city council member reports. Are there any reports from city council members since May 23rd? Uh, council member Combs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Wilson. Two report outs first. Um, my uh, uh, office hours have been paused until July 15th. Uh, because of tra traveling and so just want to to, to sh share that um that they they will resume they have been paused and resume on july 15th um and i also wanted to um share uh, uh, also in reference to the public comment earlier that last week the jpa received a report during a special meeting from uh santa clara valley of water that uh calls into question some of the assumptions um, that the JP has made in connection with water levels and flows um, that were the basis of, of that are the basis of, of some of our, our, our projects, specifically the replacement of Pope Chaucer and also some creek, creek whitening projects in San Francisco Creek. Um, and so I'm not going to go into details, <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but the, the, the JPA will, will Obviously, we have this information now, and, and we'll be exploring what what impacts that that has on our on our projects in the, uh, the the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. That is indeed a huge update. So, um, thank you for that, Councilmember Combs. Um, any other Councilmember reports? I see Vice Mayor Taylor. Please. Thank you, uh, Mayor Wilson, and actually just a report out regarding the community amenities subcommittee, which I am happy to see that the discussion will happen at the council level at the July 13th meeting. 
Um, Council Member Nash and I have a subcommittee report that was written up that will be attached to the minutes and available. I'm not sure when. <laughs> now. I believe, um, unless anyone has any concerns about it, we can send it to CCIM so it'll be available to anyone who wants to look there. Yes. And the, go ahead, Mayor. It'll be attached to the minutes or the agenda? Well, would I, uh, City Clerk Heron, um, can, at this hour, I will need your help here. Um, so how does it work? So these would be attached to the minutes, the draft minutes for this meeting will be uh, hopefully on the June 27th meeting. So, I mean, they'll be available uh, the Thursday before the agenda publishing for June 27th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Councilmember Nash will send it to CCIN. And this is to, pr to provide an update on the community amenities um, for a couple reasons. One is just to get background out there and remind folks of why the subcommittee even exists. And two, to provide accurate information, um, especially after listening to a couple of the planning commissions and their concerns about the community amenities. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, Council Member Nash, your door. Council Member Nash. So I actually um, just, there was a Meta Local Community Fund um, meeting. We've, uh, we funded 28 organizations and I will not go through any more. If anyone's interested in more information, please reach out to me. Um, also P PCE met, um, finalizing, um, a, doing an initial budget and finalizing the DEAI, um, the Stanford Community um, Resource Group met, and there is a draft EIR that was released yesterday um, for the um, Stanford Unincorporated um, Housing Element and the Community Plan Update, and I will stop at that. Thank you. Council Member Doerr, any updates? Okay, and um, for me, uh, I reported out basically at the fire district joint meeting about a local policymaker group Caltrain meeting uh, workshop I attended looking at a quarter wide grade separation um, study. Um, so you can look back at my comments if you want to learn more. Um, and then we have a commute.org meeting actually uh, here at City Hall. Uh, this week, we're using a remote location. So commute.org is kind of piloting um, remote board meeting um, configurations where there's multiple satellite locations. So there's like a North County and a South County. So Menlo Park will be hosting some commute.org board members. So we'll look at that a little bit as a pilot. I see some nods from Councilmember Combs. It's listening intently. So commute.org's mission is to reduce um, vehicle trips. And so um, as we all sit on large regional boards that people come from many distances, um, I can report back on how this um, remote meeting configuration works out. So you may want to bring it to your other regional boards as well. Um, and Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, uh, Mayor Woolison. And I actually have a request, and this is as a MPCC subcommittee, and that is my request, hopefully with the support of the council, that we can actually reopen the survey um, that's regarding the naming. And that's because I've had several people over the past couple months come up to me and tell me things that I'd prefer that they actually put in the survey because I am not going to remember half of what they say. And also, I think it's a way for... Um, to provide a little more transparency to whatever their input is. Okay, I'm seeing nods. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, Councilmember Nash. I'm sorry. Um, Peninsula Clean Energy has an e bikes for everyone program um, up to $1,000 to purchase an e bike um, for eligible residents that just reopened and um, go to peninsula and peninsulacleanenergy.com slash ebikes. And I will send an email to um, CCIN about this as well. And I bet that's going to go really fast because I know it went super fast last time. It did. This is for eligible residents. Correct. But still. Okay. Um, okay. So we are now as promised i um, going to take public comment one more time or offer public comment one more time on our closed session item. So City Clerk Karen, can you please reopen public comment for our closed session item M1?
Yes, thank you, Mayor Willison. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on closed session item M1, which is a conference with labor negotiators, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. Calling in from a landline or a cell phone, press star nine. If participating in person, complete a speaker card at the back table and return to me at the clerk's desk. Final call for public comment on closed session item M1. Seeing no hands, no cards. Mayor Willison, you may continue. Thank you, City Clerk Karen. So the time is, I don't have my glasses on, 1042. And I will be adjourning this regular meeting and we will be reconvening in closed session. The closed session report out, if any, will occur at the June 27th City Council meeting. Thank you and good night. <laughs>